Gotham's yours, sweetheart. Nothing's standing in your way now. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Colton Ogburn, and this is a complete breakdown of The Penguin. We are giving you all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed from every single episode of this brilliant series. <laughs> In this redefining of the Batman story, the Penguin serves as a lieutenant for the mob boss and Batman villain Carmine Falcone. The Riddler has blown up the Gotham City seawalls, resulting in a massive flood. The opening newscast in this episode discusses how the more affluent communities and their homes were left unaffected by the flood, while the working class of Gotham has been greatly impacted. And this is really well depicted with the city skyline of Gotham. The rich and powerful elites who operate in the city are literally safe from the flood up in their ivory towers, while those like the Penguin who operate in the belly of the beast have been greatly affected by this flood. In the opening seconds of this episode, we hear this snippet about Don Mitchell Jr. This being the Riddler's first kill and the murder that is being investigated at the beginning of the 2022 Batman film. We also hear mentions of Carmine Falcone's arrest and his murder. In this opening sequence, we can see shots from the Batman, such as this shot of the Penguin looking out the window following the flood, a shot that in the Batman movie is narrated by Batman saying, And some will seize the chance to grab everything they can which is exactly what Penguin is doing in this series. We also have this shot of Mayor Elect Real that was also shown in The Batman. We will rebuild. Together, we will learn to believe in Gotham again. The music playing is from The Batman's phenomenal score by Michael Giacchino. Together, we will learn to believe in Gotham again. We should also mention that Michael's son, Mick, is scoring the Penguin series. So we hear the newscasters say, Watching the Batman vigilante atop Gotham Square Garden, helping to save the lives of hundreds of injured victims. Which is of course in reference to this scene in the final moments of the Batman. People need hope to know someone's out there for them. And I loved this shot that once again echoed Matt Reeves theme of class warfare showing the Gotham City skyline and then panning down into the depths of Gotham where we find the penguin who I might add is sporting his classic umbrella. So Penguin arrives at the Iceberg Lounge, the club that he ran in the Batman. He breaks into Carmine's safe where he finds dirt on various people, including Johnny Vitti, Carmine's nephew and enforcer from the comics. Vitti first appeared in Batman 407, which was part of the Batman Year One arc. And in The Long Halloween, a comic we'll talk about here shortly, Vitti is the first victim of the Holiday Killer, who is actually in this show, but more on that in a bit. So in this file, we get a fun nod to Austin Wittick, the costume designer on this series. We can also see this photo of Councilman Haiti that Penguin will later use as blackmail. Haiti, of course, first appeared in the Batman comics back in 2012. We then meet Alberto Falcone, Carmine Falcone's drug addict's son. Al's an addict, sweetheart. He's got a penchant for drops. Alberto Falcone's most prominent comic book appearance was his role in the classic Batman story, the aforementioned The Long Halloween, where he takes on the moniker of the Holiday Killer, a villain who is also featured in the comic Batman Dark Victory. In the comics, the Holiday Killer murdered members of the competing crime family run by Salvador Moroni, which we will be talking about more here in just a bit. Penguin says, Staying off the drops. A reference to what the drugs are called in the Batman. But drops and other drugs are still rampant. It's saying, gotten worse. I should also point out that he is being played by the same guy who played Randall in season two of The Walking Dead. Here we can see Alberto's hand shaking, echoing the same fear and cowardice we saw in him in Long Halloween. He always wanted to be the top guy, but he never had the guts to make it happen. We then get our second mention of Salvador Moroni. Wasn't always his used to be Salvatore's. Now, we have seen Moroni before on the big screen in The Dark Knight. The rivalry between Falcone and Moroni is a classic one in the comics, and Moroni in the comics is the guy who throws acid on Harvey Dent, turning him into the notorious Two-Face. So Penguin mentions Rex Calabrese. When I was a kid, I was a gangster, real old school type, Rex Calabrese. Rex was first introduced in Batman Eternal number 14, and he was later retconned into being the biological father of Catwoman, who typically is Carmine Falcone, like in the Batman movie. So after killing Alberto, we see Penguin return to his car, where we see these kids messing with it and attempting to steal his wheels, reminiscent of the opening scene from Logan. Our very own Lee Mazio also pointed out that this is exactly how Batman found his second Robin, Jason Todd, in Batman number 408. Penguin catches a young man named Victor, who begs for his life and is revealed to have a stutter. 
Please, please, please. Victor's disability brings out the penguin's sympathy. Please, oh, please, Jesus, don't take a breath. Penguin himself has been mocked for his facial deformities and his limp, so it makes sense that he would have a softer side for someone who also suffers from a disability. And this scene happening right after Penguin killed Alberto for laughing at him was just perfect. Not only did we see Penguin's disdain for being looked at like a freak, but we also saw his two sides. He's a villain, no doubt, he's a criminal, but he's not evil. There are parts of him that are a good guy, sort of like Tony Soprano. I don't give a f All right, don't give a f so on Alberto's phone calendar, we can see November 23rd with Gotham Knights. Gotham Knights is a moniker that was given to the Bat family in the comics and was also the title of a video game and a CW show. Here we can see the Burgess Jewelry Store, a reference to Burgess Meredith, who played the Penguin in the 1960 Batman TV show. Yes, I'm afraid you'll have to unravel the rest of my plot by yourself. Here we see Penguin now donning a purple suit, just like his extravagant and colorful suits we've seen in the comics and in the cartoons. Here we can see banners that read help us don't forget us stop drops and real change all showing the distress of gotham's residents affected by the flood as well as the rampant crime the same rampant crime that inspired bruce wayne to become the batman just a little over a year prior next we hear mention of the odessa mob a brutal russian mob family from the batman comics who only cared about selling drugs and laundering money i got jumped by the odessa mob maybe a burnley town i don't know what happened fast but... bristol township is a small town in gotham that houses the first families of Gotham. It's also where Wayne Manor resides. Burnside is an area of Gotham, an area we actually saw Barbara Gordon, aka Batgirl, actually move to in the 2011 Batgirl comic. And Robbinsville, which is mentioned a little later, is another neighborhood in Gotham named after comic artist Frank Robbins. Next, we meet Milos Grappa. He, like many characters in the series, was first introduced in The Long Halloween as Carmine Falcone's bodyguard. And next, we meet Carmine's daughter, Sophia Falcone. And man, is she eerily terrifying in the best way possible. She first appeared, like seemingly everyone else in this series, in The Long Halloween, issue number six to be specific, and we learn that she has spent time in Arkham Asylum, the place where most of Batman's baddies are sent. I thought you were still at, uh... Arkham? No. I've been rehabilitated. And I really love this lunch scene between Penguin and Sophia. We hear her talk about how Carmine, her father, would not let her put her elbows on the table, but Penguin, on the other hand, encourages her. Well, who's stopping you now, huh? This, once again, is showing us the dichotomy between elite criminals in their ivory towers, like Carmine Falcone, and criminals down in the slums, like Penguin, who are fighting daily for their piece of the pie. We also hear the mention of her comic book alias, The Hangman. What the cassette call me? The Hangman? This was Sophia's moniker in the comics when she went on a bit of a killing spree. Next, we see Penguin and Victor getting on the train, and this was probably my favorite scene in the episode. We see these two open handicap seats, but Oz, despite his limp and constant pain from the arthritis in his foot, he refuses to take a seat. He refuses to accept what he views as a crutch. This is once again driving home the fact that Penguin and Victor are both burdened by a disability, but their refusal to sit in the handicap seats amplifies their refusal to allow their their disability to define them. They are too proud to accept any form of help. It's also on the train that we see someone wearing a Riddler mask, like in the Batman. This is, of course, a Riddler sympathizer, like the ones we saw in the Batman, and this also echoes the Joker sympathizers in mask wearers that we saw in the Joker film. And if you scan this QR code, it will take you to the Rata Alada, the same website from the Batman. There, you can find a missing newspaper page about Alberto Falcone. In Penguin's car, we get arguably the funniest scene in the episode and one of the biggest reveals really penguin is a dolly parton fan and hey goofs aside this song actually does relate to penguin i mean look at the lyrics want to move ahead but the boss won't seem to let me i swear sometimes the man is out to get me and it's a rich man's game no matter what they call it and you spend your life putting money in his wallet this is literally the situation that penguin has found himself in and has been in for the bulk of his life so next we meet penguin's mom this city is meant to be yours sweetheart what are you gonna do to get it 
And I loved how this showed us that Penguin trusts his new friend Victor with knowing the location of his mother. He's very protective of his mother, and it says a lot that Penguin was comfortable bringing Victor there. Penguin's mother says, You know I hate flying. Which is hilarious because penguins, of course, are flightless birds. Then Penguin goes to Blackgate Penitentiary, the jailhouse in Gotham for the non-insane criminals, unlike those in Arkham Asylum. Blackgate Penitentiary first appeared in Detective Comics 629. We then meet Sal Maroney in the flesh, being played by the iconic Clancy Brown of Spongebob fame, of course. Let me play a sad song for you on the world's smallest violin. Penguin gets in yet another car chase, echoing back to his chase with Batman. I got you! And I loved how this episode began with Penguin putting a Falcone in the trunk of his car and then it ended with him putting himself in the trunk of his car to avoid being captured by a Falcone. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. Now, in the car, we see Penguin bash this guy into his radio, making another song come on, similar to the greatest showman scene in Deadpool 3 when Wolverine is bashing Deadpool's head into the radio. The song, however, that comes on Penguin's radio is The Promise by When in Rome. The lyrics are, I'm sorry, but I'm just thinking of the right words to say. I know they don't sound the way I plan them to be, but if you wait around a while, I'll make you fall for me. This song encapsulates what we're supposed to feel for Penguin. He's not the hero that we need, but if we stick through, if we stick with him long enough, perhaps we will come to like him. So the episode ends with Penguin being cleared for the murder of Alberto when Victor sends a car crashing in that of course has Alberto's body in the trunk. However, his body is missing his pinky finger and his father's ring, which of course originally belonged to Moroni. Perfectly parallels how in the comics, Sophia didn't receive her father father's dead body, but she did receive his finger and ring. So we open with Sophia in Arkham Asylum, the classic insane asylum for Batman's rogues gallery. She's wearing the same jumper we've seen the Riddler and the Joker wear in the Batman. We also see her in this same visiting spot from the Batman where we saw the Bat talk with Riddler and in a deleted scene, Barry Keegan's Joker. We hear Sophia again referred to as the Hangman, her moniker in the Batman comics like Dark Victory. This flashback scene is revealed to be part of Sophia's light therapy. This type of therapy is called EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. It's a mental health treatment that helps the patient process trauma by reliving the events and overcoming them. This was a great way of reminding us and foreshadowing just how fractured Sophia's psyche is. Now, in this therapist's office, we see this painting on the wall. It's called Scream Louder, Scream Twice by artist Rosario Olivia. The description of this painting is a silent scream that breaks the soul in two. This perfectly mirrors Sophia's current mental state and her struggle to be Sophia Falcone and not fall back into the persona of the hangman. This painting also connects to the penguin with him also being torn between being a decent guy and a downright murderous criminal. Now, we also want to point out that Sophia's style in this series is spot on with her comic counterpart. Classy dresses, pantsuits, and heavy overcoats. And I really loved this little detail of seeing the penguin drink drinking Pepto, showing us that he is stressed out and that's causing stomach problems. It also reminded me a lot of the gangster from Dumb and Dumber who was chewing up these pills when he got stressed. Pills are good! Pills are good! Now, Penguin once again arrives at Blackgate Prison to visit Sal Maroney. It's also worth mentioning that Clancy Brown played a prison guard in the movie Shawshank Redemption, and in the previous episode, we saw a Rita Hayworth movie, Gilda, and Rita Hayworth was, of course, also in Shawshank Redemption. Now, in the comics, Blackgate Prison is where the non-clinically insane Batman foes are sent, and I thought it was a nice touch that this series has introduced the two different prisons. They have Sal in a standard maximum security prison while they had Sophia in the same insane asylum as the likes of the Riddler and the Joker. Having these two different prisons drives home the fact that while both of these villains are of course baddies, Sophia is on a different level and way scarier than just some gangster. At this meeting, we see Sal's wife, Nadia Maroney. She's not in the comics and she was actually created for this show. And this is one of Sal's sons, possibly Umberto or Pino Maroney. Next, we're introduced 
introduced to Carmine's little brother, Luca Falcone. Now, there is a Luca Falcone in the comics, but he isn't Carmine's brother. He's his cousin. And in the comics, he actually dies at the hands of the Red Hood gang during the comic Batman Zero Year number 22. Here we see a painting behind him called The Siege of Monte Massi. In short, this painting depicts an Italian military commander at a siege, and it makes total sense that an Italian mobster would want this in their war room. Next, we can hear the song playing Call Me Irresponsible by Frank Sinatra. Yes, I am unreliable. This song is so fitting for the current circumstances. Not only is Sinatra revered in these circles, but the lyrics of this specific song, call me irresponsible, call me unreliable, throw in undependable too, all fit Penguin with his betrayal of the Falcons and the war he's orchestrating between them and the Maronis for his own benefit. Here we can hear Sophia ask, Why aren't his killers strung up across the city? This is of course a nod to how she left her victims in the comics, noosing them and leaving them to hang for all to see. And that's seemingly what she is accused of doing in this universe as well. Now on the radio we can hear, Leave it on. is a serial killer, seven women. And this is actually different from her comic book killings where she targeted police and those like Harvey Dent, aka Two-Face for their efforts in bringing down her father. Oz mentions the Sprang River, a reference to Dick Sprang, a comic book artist best known for his work on Batman during the Golden Age of Comics. The detective that Sophia meets with is Marcus Wise. He's from the Robin comics. Now, he was actually a member of the Gotham City Police Department who leveraged his position as a cop to commit crimes within the corrupt department, and he blackmailed a few fellow officers. This is, of course, in line with the many corrupt police we saw in the Batman film. Insane. Kinsey Moon Knights for the Penguin. My mom is just a cop. At the bar, we hear the bartender say, Take it up with the Riddler. This is a reference, of course, to the Batman film and how the Riddler's terroristic actions have set all of this in motion. So Victor is from Crown Point, and that is one of the most impoverished places in all of Gotham. In the comics, it's actually known as the absolute worst place in the entire city. Vic, being from Crown Point, and the reveal that they lost everything in the flood once again drives home the class warfare and class disparity that Matt Reeves said he wanted this series to demonstrate. Back with Sophia, we see that she's sleeping in her closet, once again showing us that she is still mentally locked away in her Arkham cell. So here we can see that Sophia has scratches on her neck that she has given herself in her sleep. They look like the scars left behind by a noose symbolizing that the hangman is attacking Sophia from within. At Alberto's funeral, we see protesters outside the church with hang the hangman signs, which of course mirror the memorial scene from the Batman. Among these signs, we can also see a Riddler sign. This is yet another example of how the Riddler, despite having been defeated and locked away in Arkham, his movement and his actions from the Batman are still echoing throughout Gotham. And I loved this shot of Sophia behind these barred windows, symbolizing that despite her freedom, she is still once again mentally trapped in her Arkham cell and burdened by her trauma. We then have a quote from Thomas Sankara. We are fighting this system that allows a handful of men on Earth to rule all of humanity. Sankara was a revolutionary leader in Burkina Faso, who eventually became president after a coup and launched a myriad of economic, environmental, and societal reforms that Riddler fans seem to be inspired by. Now here, Oz is talking about his brothers, Jack and Benny. How we celebrated them, you know, Jack and Benny. This is a reference to the comedian Jack Benny, who actually met Batman in a comic. Now, in the comics, Jack and Benny aren't actually his brother's names. He actually had three older brothers, Jason, William, and Robert. In the comic Penguin Pain and Prejudice, we learn that Oz actually murdered his brothers because they bullied him as a child. We've seen in this series, as well as in the Batman, that Oz doesn't tolerate being made fun of or laughed at. Hell, he shot Alberto dead for daring to cackle at his expense. Fucking laugh, Batman. Next, we see Sophia told that she needs to go to Italy. Italy. It's beautiful this time of year. Now, between the comics Long Halloween and Dark Victory, Sophia did travel to Italy. She was actually paralyzed at the time and in a wheelchair. But while in Italy, she learned how to walk again, but she kept that a secret, and this allowed her to then go on to become the hangman killer upon returning to Gotham. Our own Ryan Airy pointed out that here, Sophia is wearing a zebra print. Zebras, of course, are passive animals, but underneath this zebra print, we can see a red dress, and red here is symbolizing violence and rage. And our own Harriet Lingle Enright caught that when Sophia is pushed out of the room so the men can talk, 
dialogue, it echoes this scene with Kay from The Godfather, the original mob movie that has inspired classics like The Sopranos and, of course, this series as well. Now, in the closing moments of the episode, we hear the song Happy Together by The Turtles, but it is being covered by Floor Cry. This song, however, isn't actually about a happy couple. Rather, it's someone imagining their happiness together, hence the lyrics, Imagine you and me, I do, I think about you day and night, it's only right. Oz and Sophia are not on the same page by any means, but they're both imagining that they are. Sophia thinks that Oz will have her back, and Oz thinks that Sophia doesn't know any better. He's making the mistake of underestimating her, just like Oz is underestimated by the others. The others' underestimation of Oz will be key to his rise to power, but Oz's underestimation of Sophia could be the key to his own downfall. Okay, so we open with this shot of Bella Real Flyers on the ground, and they read, Vote for Real Change. This is reminiscent, of course, of the 2008 Obama campaign, whose slogan was Hope and Change. Now, this scene is, of course, happening prior to the Riddler's destruction of the seawalls that we'll actually see blow up a few moments later. Now, I felt that there was really something eerie about this flyer being on the ground. We know that Victor's family and many of the downtrodden, hardworking people in Victor's neighborhood supported Bella Real, and while she does win this election, their victory is met with the tragedy of the Riddler's attack, which kills many of her constituents. On the ground, we also see this Gotham Gazette newspaper. The Gotham-based paper first appeared way back in 1940 in Batman number four. Next, we meet Graciela, who we actually saw texting Vic in the previous episode. On the TV, we hear returns from the mayoral election indicating that Real is in the lead against Tomlin. Tomlin being the current mayor after the murder of Mayor Don Mitchell Jr by the Riddler at the beginning of the Batman. The name Tomlin is actually a nod to the writer Mattson Tomlin, who wasn't credited for the 2022 The Batman, but who is going to be credited in the upcoming sequel, which it was just reported that's not coming out for another two years. So in a conversation with his father, we hear Victor tell his dad that he should be making more money for the amount of work that he is putting in. You act like wanting more is a bad thing, but I mean, don't you want a better life than this? If you remember where we came from, we have more than enough. Victor's father is quick to dismiss this and insists that he is compensated plenty. Vic's father gives the impression that wanting for more is a bad thing, and he has the impression that you should be happy with what you have and be grateful for the roof over your head. While Vic, on the other hand, feels like his father, his family, and himself deserve more. This perfectly tees up Victor's eventual partnership with Oz for a life of crime and later scenes when Vic talks about his father never getting to eat at nice restaurants or how his father would be ashamed of him for the life that he has chosen. It's also Vic's lust for more and achieving the high life that we see set up in this scene, foreshadowing his decision not to join Graciela on the bus. Now, both Oz and Vic come from small beginnings, but where Victor's father taught him to be grateful for what he has, Oz's mother taught him to always want and fight for more. Oh, you're so close now. Having everything you ever wanted, everything you deserve. If you want to run, you want to hide, no. This city is meant to be yours, sweetheart. We also hear about Squid. This could be in reference to another Gotham crime boss from the comics, Lawrence Lamont. Calvin not a part of Squid's crew. He's not as renowned as the Falcones or the Moronis, but Squid did make a name for himself as a ruthless mobster in the comics. And he first appeared in Detective Comics number 497 in 1980. He also worked closely with other Batman foes like Killer Croc. Here we can see the La Caron restaurant, which means the crown in French. This is of course symbolic of the fact that Oz, Sophia, and even Victor are in pursuit of obtaining that crown, obtaining power, wealth, respect, as well as the throne of the Gotham underworld. We then see from Victor's perspective the Riddler's detonation of the Gotham seawall which floods Victor's neighborhood and we see for the first time just how brutal this attack was on the civilians of Gotham. Watching this bridge get broken by the water creates the imagery of the sink or swim mentality. The bridge to success that some like Sophia Falcone have laid out for them from the start is metaphorically and now physically not available for people like Victor who come from small beginnings. 
Gardens. This destruction of an already impoverished neighborhood and the bridge that leads to the city, which resembles wealth and achievement, has now created a scenario where only the strongest willed and perhaps the most morally flexible stand a chance at escaping. Now, this whole series has been about the effects of the Riddler's act of terror on this city and how it has affected the people of Gotham, primarily those who were already figuratively having a hard time keeping their head above water. And now here they are literally being drowned. And it's really, really ironic that the Riddler claimed to be a warrior for the everyman in a fight against the elite, yet his attack on the city hurt the poor and working class the most. Here we see the Elliot Bridge, which could be a nod to the Elliot family in Gotham. Edward Elliot was named in the Batman as having been killed by Falcone. He's also the grandfather of the Batman villain Hush, aka Thomas Elliot, another villain from Batman's rogues gallery that would fit nicely in this universe Matt Reeves has created for the Batman. Here in Oz's apartment, we see a painting behind Vic that is a man examining jewels. By the front door, we see another picture that features different types of diamonds. This shows us that Oz is consumed by material things, and he's a connoisseur of nice luxury items, and he likes to surround himself with them. So throughout this episode, we once again see Sophia wearing turtlenecks and chokers to hide her neck scars and give the imagery of a noose around her own neck like the victims of the hangman. Last episode, we talked about how Sophia is doing everything she can to keep her darker half locked away inside of her, but that the hangman is literally trying to claw its way out of Sophia and hang her like all of its other victims. And hey, in this series, Sophia is absolutely terrifying. There's a moment later in this episode where Johnny Vitti threatens her and you don't think for a second that we should actually be fearful for Sophia's life. Your immediate thought is, oh, she's gonna kill him. Now, one of the things that added to her fear factor in the comics was that she's huge, kind of like Marvel's Kingpin. Her last name is even Gigante. But this version of Sophia is short and petite, and honestly, I think that makes her all the more terrifying. Now, in Oz's apartment, we see Sophia call Oz's fireplace tacky. Yet another example of the class disparity happening in Gotham and between characters like Sophia, who come from money, and characters like Oz and Victor, who come from nothing. Sophia asks Vic if he's a mechanic. You're a mechanic. Um, yeah, uh, kind of. Now, Vic's father was a mechanic, so this is again showing us how far Vic has strayed from the path in life that his father would have expected of him. Next, we see that Vic is unable to ignite this lighter, but Sophia and later Oz can do it no problem. Now, on its surface, this of course just means that Vic doesn't have much experience with a Zippo lighter, but I think we're meant to take something else from this exchange. Oz and Sophia have both stepped into the fire. There's no going back. They're in this life for good, while Vic, on the other hand, is still teetering on that edge in this episode. He could still get out if he wanted to, but at the end of the episode, he makes his choice and now he's in it for good. We then get another great shot showing the perspective of the underworld of Gotham where Oz can operate in a stealth-like fashion, seemingly avoiding even the attention of the Batman. We actually had a shot just like this one in the first episode that showed the tall buildings, then panning down to the train, and then into the dark streets beneath. All of course symbolizing the class disparity and warfare that this this series is about, as well as Oz, Victor, and Sophia's lust to climb that ladder. Next, we meet Trey Bloom, Sophia's chemist. This name could be a reference to the Batman villain, Mr. Bloom. We'll just have to see. We're then introduced to the new product. These are bleeding tooth fungi, a rare strain. Sophia says, find me a distributor and we'll paint the town red. Which is a triple entendre. Now, not only does this saying have a reckless connotation, but painting it red is an allusion to blood, the blood of those who wish to control Oz and Sophia, and of course the red ooze from the product itself. So when Graciela asks about Calvin, it sounded to me like Vic was lying. Calvin's not with you, is he? Uh, no, no, I, I haven't seen him. This is probably because he doesn't want to share with her that the last time he saw him, he was being shot at by the man whose apartment they're standing in. We then get yet another example of class disparity when we see Sophia handed this first class plane ticket. So next we meet the Triads, a Chinese criminal organization from the comics, also known as the Lucky Hand Triad. They're a group of drug traffickers who run Chinatown in the underworld of Gotham. They have ties to the classic Batman foe, Ra's al Ghul. To conquer fear, you must become fear 
must bask in the fear of other men. So Oz coins the new drug Bliss, which is a drug from the comics first introduced in the 2008 run of Titans. It's a hallucinogenic that was actually created using the hormones of kidnapped children. And I really loved how in this scene we're getting to see Oz and Sophia work their magic and sell this guy on their product. It's giving us a glimpse into their history from before she went away to Arkham. Now back with Vic, we see him falling more and more into the life of a criminal, smoothly bribing a corrupt Gotham cop. It's a lot of money for a kid your age to be carrying around. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any money. Now at this restaurant, we see Oz scold the waiter for interrupting Vic mid-stutter. The man was speaking. Let him finish. But later in the episode, Oz does the same thing to Vic. It's the... F it's the... F of Jesus, kid! Amplifying the fact that Oz thinks that the rules don't apply to him, even rules that he himself has set. So at the club, we see Penguin donning a white suit, reminiscent of his white suit from the classic Batman comic run, No Man's Land. In that comic, we see Gotham quite literally shaken by a severe earthquake. Most of the city is evacuated by the US government and the bridges in and out of the city are destroyed, turning Gotham into a No Man's Land. This was semi-adapted in the Dark Knight Rises movie when Bane takes over Gotham. Gotham, and it could again be adapted in the Batman sequel with Gotham having suffered a major catastrophe with the Riddler's flood. So Sophia tells Oz, You say all the right things, don't you, Oz? Which is also true for herself when she says she danced on her father's grave. And as soon as I had the chance, I danced on his grave. Sophia is a proud Falcone, but she's also ambitious and will say what needs to be said to get what she wants, just like Oz. We get yet another glimpse at the themes of class warfare with Sophia wanting to take advantage of the downtrodden during these rough times following the flood. These people need to escape, and nothing delivers a better escape than bliss. Sophia then mentions the Odessa mob and the Neon Dragons. But if you are not interested, it's fine. I can go to the Neon Dragons or the Odessa mob. The Neon Dragons are another Gotham City gang who appeared in the Batman and Robin comics. The Odessa mob are Russian mobsters who appear around the same time as the triad in the comics, and the two gangs went to war over the murder of the Odessa's leader. So next we hear the song Broken Belief by Bob Moses playing, and the lyrics to this song relate perfectly to what Victor is going through. We live in the era of purpose. We live in the era of youth. When the wise man's warning is worthless, I'm just a poor boy begging for truth. Victor is afraid that his father's warnings and beliefs aren't lining up with his current state of life. He's afraid his father would be ashamed of him, but Oz is telling him that that warning is meaningless and that there is no good or bad, it's just life. So Victor really is just a poor boy begging for truth. So guys, I think this episode did a great job at showing us the relationship that was between Oz and Sophia without having to give us any like gratuitous flashbacks. We learned that it was Oz who screwed her over and abandoned her to climb the ladder in his own career. Just like we saw Vic abandon Graciela to return to his life of crime at the end of the episode. Again, Victor's actions are echoing those of Oz. And we close with the song Me and the Devil by Gilscore Heron. This song is about someone coming to terms with the demons inside them. And this applies to Oz, Sophia, and Victor. Sophia is getting closer and closer to releasing her inner demon which is the hangman, who, as we've discussed, is literally trying to claw its way out of her. Victor has accepted his walk with the devil by not taking his literal ticket out of town and choosing to stay and walk with his own devil, Oz. Vic has now killed a Maroni. There's no going back from that. And Oz, of course, released his inner demons years ago, and we see them most active in his fits of rage, especially the ones against Victor. You chose to stay. How about you ask yourself why? But something each of these characters realizes is that in order to make it in this business, they need those demons. So we see Oz and Victor escape, leaving Sophia behind, which I actually found a little surprising, but then again, Oz's plan is to betray her and the Falcone, so it shouldn't be much of a shock that he left her behind. We have to remember that these characters aren't noble. They aren't the good guys. We are following a cast of villains. And that's why I compare this show to shows like The Sopranos. Not just because of the mob genre, but because of the fact that there really isn't a good guy in the entire show. This episode opens with Oz and Sophia being captured by the Maronis, just like we saw at the end of the previous episode. Sophia now knows that Oz has betrayed her and the family, and that reluctant trust that she had put in Oz, likely the last morsel of trust she had left in her entire body, is now gone for good. Oz says, I need a Sophia to get the new drug. 
Right, for us. And this is his entire shtick when it comes to sweet talking those he wants to take under his wing and use for his own benefit. Partnering with Sophia is for us. Giving Vic a job as his driver is for us. Betraying the Falcons to work with Sal Maroney is for us. Oz is a manipulator, a liar, and a cheat by trade. He will do and say anything to work his way to the top. I don't know you a thing. No, you're right, you don't. I owe you. Here on Sophia's phone, we can see Todd Olivieri. He's actually a credited electrician on this show, and he also worked on The Dark Knight. Sophia calls Julian Rush for help, her therapist that we saw in episode two, and who we'll see more of in this flashback episode. At this point, Rush is really the only person Sophia feels that she can trust. In this flashback, we see Sophia wearing a red dress. Now, the color red can symbolize many things, but in this show, it of course has a connection to the drug Bliss and the blood of Oz and Sophia. Sophia's enemies. And we'll paint the town red. Seeing Sophia donning this red dress in an otherwise happy moment from her life is foreshadowing the hardship and violence to come. She is on her path to Arkham where she'll first encounter the red medicine as well as take her first life and be covered in red. Here we can see the same cigarette case from the previous episode, nice touch. In her conversation with Oz, who at this time is a mere driver, Sophia says, a shitty job, I know. You deserve better. But later in this episode, she'll demean Oz for being a driver. Oz, you are my driver. That is all you are. So stop talking and drive. Just like she did in the previous episode. Zhao is here to see me, not my former driver. Sophia and Oz are two sides of the same coin. They both say what they think the other needs to hear to further their own cause. You say all the right things, don't you, Oz? But they also fall victim to their own temper and say hurtful things at times because it's what they need to hear to make themselves feel better. I don't give a f oh, they don't give a f Sophia says to Oz, You sick, so at least you're eligible for a promotion. Which is essentially the thesis for this episode, as well as for Sophia's character. She's arguably the most capable character in this entire series, but she was overlooked because she's a woman. Her father saw her potential, but when he became threatened by her, he immediately betrayed her and locked her away and created this fiction that she was crazy. You're clearly not yourself. Confused, sick. So this is Summer Gleason, and her character was actually first introduced in the Batman animated series, but she's also been adapted into the comics, similar to a character like Harley Quinn, who first appeared in the animated show and then was brought into the comics. Summer was a bit of a stand-in for the Vicki Vale character. Next up on Gotham Insider, she's gorgeous, she's deadly, and she's back in town. Next we hear about Yolanda Jones. I don't know if you're aware, but a young woman named Yolanda Jones committed suicide last week? It becomes clear that Carmine Falcone strangled a lot of women over the years, such as the waitress from the Batman. We then get an even further flashback in time where Sophia finds her mother hanging in her bedroom at, of course, her father's hand. Carmine Falcone, of course, being the true hangman. We then see Sophia looking at this picture of her family, which is hanging on the wall. This could be foreshadowing how soon Sophia will be the only living member of her immediate family, and then eventually, the only Falcone left at the end of this episode. We then get the return of Carmine Falcone, now played by Mark Strong, and not John Turturro like in The Batman. He's wearing his same red lens glasses from The Batman, red once again thematically symbolizing rage and violence, and in this instance it shows us that Carmine sees everything with a red tint. He sees everything through the eyes of his darker self, his inner demons. Even demons have inner demons. Inner demons, of course, being a theme throughout this entire series, with Oz having his darker half that talks down to Vic, and with Sophia having this inner hangman that we'll later discuss was created during her time in Arkham. So when Sophia attempted to remove Carmine's glasses as a child, he quickly put them back on. And this shows us that Carmine has a determination not to see things through the lens of a compassionate human being or a father. He needs to see things through the eyes of his darker self so that he can do things like lie to his daughter about his mother's death, which he of course caused, and then go on to frame her for that murder. We then hear mention of a Congressman Hill. 
wife of Congressman Hill. This could be in reference to Hamilton Hill, the corrupt Gotham mayor from the comics, various shows, and even some video games. He first appeared in Detective Comics 503. In the comics, he's swayed by corruption just like every other power-hungry POS in Gotham. And he uses his political power to help another mob boss, Rupert Throne, commit various crimes throughout Gotham. He even once fired Jim Gordon. Here, Carmine calls Alberto soft. He's soft. Which is spot on with the comics. We've talked before about how the Batman and this series have a lot of ties to the Batman comic, The Long Halloween. In that comic, we see Alberto aiming to gain respect from his father. Alberto thinks by becoming the holiday killer, his father will see him as something other than soft and weak. Now, Carmine finding his son to be weak and not up to the test is a theme that we see in pretty much every adaptation of their relationship, even the long Halloween animated movie. Business time. Take your crosswords for a walk. They're logic puzzles. Carmine says, She refused my help. God knows I try. This is another recurring theme with Carmine. Rarely does help from Carmine actually mean help. For example, he told Annika in The Batman that he was going to help her, only to later strangle her. Carmine's help usually results in the woman winding up dead, or in Sophia's case, something worse. Alberto calls Oz Penguin. Hey, penguin up there is gonna have to clean this up. This echoes how Alberto mocked Oz in the first episode of this series, which ultimately got him killed. Sophia defending Oz shows us that she does care about him and that she was different from her brother and even her father. Don't call him that. She wasn't cruel until they forced her to be. Sophia also says to her brother, You know, like with all the lies that we had to tell growing up about what he does. And... Which reminded me of the Soprano kids, Meadow and AJ, and how they grew up with a mob boss father like Tony Soprano. This version of the Penguin, of course, reminding me a lot of Tony Soprano, as I've discussed in other breakdowns. Sophia asks, The girls at the 44 below, has that ever had relationships with them? Which we know he did because he's the father of Catwoman, Selena Kyle, which we learned in The Batman. I want to know why a guy like Falcone would owe you anything. Because he's my father! And his club is seemingly where he met Selena's mother, Maria. Alberto says, I can't f***ing kill me. And you'll notice the camera focuses on Oz who is listening in, and this is ironic because of course it will be Oz who ultimately kills Alberto. So Summer works for the Gotham Gazette. In the animated series, she was actually a TV reporter on the show Gotham Insider. We then learn the gruesome details to how Carmine killed 44 below waitresses like Maria Kyle and Annika. They're far more congruent with manual strangulation. These scratches on Carmine's hand are meant to mimic the scratches we see on his face from Catwoman in both the Batman as well as in the comics. Here we can see that Sophia is genuinely terrified. We now have a whole new meaning to what Sophia said to Carla about Gia in episode two. Make sure you keep her protected. A young woman in this family might not end well for her. She wasn't threatening Gia, she was warning her. And of course later, she would spare her when she takes down the Falcone household. So when Oz comes in to tell Sophia that her father wants to see her in his office, Sophia's immediate reaction is, Oz, what are you doing inside? She's caught off guard by Oz, a mere driver, being inside the house for a party, showing her elite nature. But she simultaneously compliments Oz on his new jacket. Is that a new jacket? Yeah, yeah. Looks good. Thank you. Sophia noticing something like that shows us that she does have a kind side that cares for Oz. This split between her two selves is something that has been center stage for this entire series. Sophia has two sides to herself, one being her nice half that cares about her driver and doesn't engage in cruelty like her brother and father. But there's also her other half, her elite half, her darker half. The half that she's tried to suppress, but that is ripped out of her during her time in Arkham. Her father, locking her away in Arkham for a crime she didn't commit hardened Sophia, turning her into the very woman he wanted her to be so that she could take his place as the leader of the Falcone family. Sophia says, My father sees you now. Which is all Oz ever wanted. He said as much here. Can you imagine to be remembered like that? She also says, You and everyone you love is on his radar. Which is why Oz lies about his mother being dead in episode two. 
She died a few years back, I never asked. And we get the return of William Kinsey in this episode. He's the same cop from The Batman. He was a corrupt detective who worked for both Carmine Falcone and Oz. He's the guy who kidnapped Annika and the Batman and brought her to Carmine who ultimately strangled her. And he does have a comic counterpart who is just as corrupt. Now, despite all of Carmine's talk about how much he values Sophia, as soon as she figures out what he did, he decided he had to get rid of her. This shows us just how deeply evil Carmine Falcone is, and how he only loves his children when it's advantageous for him. For example, he always viewed Alberto as weak, and he was disappointed by the fact that he felt his son would never be able to lead the family. Carmine realizing that Alberto was of no use to him made him have less love for his son. The hangman. That's what they're calling me. Now, this scene is so well done. Looking back, it is easy to see that Carmine was responsible for all of these murders. Going back to the Batman, the two women he strangled, that's his MO. And then using Sophia's comic alias as a media headline to immediately make the audience believe it's her. What the cassette call me? The hangman? fantastic writing. We as the audience were so quick to point the finger at Sophia and be afraid of her because of what we read in the comics. We were so quick to assume that she had murderous intents just like her father. This shows that we as the audience are just as bad as the people of Gotham who look at her as an insane murderous Falcone without even doing a double take at the true evil that was staring us right in the face in Carmine and Carmine alone. Now seeing this version of Sophia in the flashbacks compared to the Sophia that we've been watching all season is so sad. We've been calling her the villain and a psycho when really she's just another victim of Carmine's actions. She wasn't built for this life, but she was forced to become who she is now because of Carmine, which is what he always wanted. Carmine and Arkham turned Sophia into the monster that they fabricated her to be to get her locked away in the first place. So once in Arkham, we see Sophia placed in this metal neck restraint, just like the Riddler and the Joker in the Batman. This collar is also reminiscent of her neck brace from the comics. But for Sophia, this symbolizes something totally different. It symbolizes her being put in the noose of the hangman who, in reality, is her father. And then we meet Magpie. My name is Magpie, like the bird. <laughs> Now, Magpie is from the comics, and she had this killer design in the 80s, which was then undone in the New 52. She's a frequent guest at Arkham Asylum and a bit of a klepto. Here, we can hear the same hangman that was heard in the nightmare scene in episode 2. Hey, no. hey, Sophia is told by the doctor, I'm here to help you, Sophia. This is something Sophia has been told her entire life. Carmine, Oz, Luca, Rush, they've all tried to undermine her in the name of helping her. I didn't do anything wrong. This isn't a punishment. This shows us once again how truly awful Arkham Asylum is in almost every Batman adaptation. It's supposed to be a place of rehabilitation, but if anything, it makes its captives worse. Sophia's torture at Arkham is what turns her into a killer. She was a perfectly nice and decent human being before being brought into this asylum for rehabilitation. They are responsible for turning her into the very thing that they claimed they would cure. And I loved seeing her peeling back this wallpaper in her cell the same wallpaper that was in her mother's bedroom. We are seeing Sophia literally peel back the walls of her own psyche. She is having her own breakthrough with her hangman trauma within this Arkham cell. Sophia has nightmares just like we saw in episode two and the scratching of her own neck begins. So in the previous episode, Sophia was told that she had to leave for Sicily. The same thing actually happened to her brother Mario in the comics when he was deported to Italy, which was inspired by Michael Corleone according to writer Jeff Loeb. And I think it's interesting that the writers of this show have taken that bit from the comics and rolled it into the character of Sophia. Next, we learn that Rush quit his job at Arkham because of his disagreements with how they treated patients. For 10 years, men have lied to me. This line is the thesis of the entire episode. Sophia is done. Her snapping wasn't due to her father's death, Alberto's death, or even the death of her mother. It's the fact that every single man that she has ever met wants her to fit this perfect mold of the Sophia that they want her to be. Carmine wants a quiet and reliable Sophia to then lead the family in his absence. Oz wants a Sophia that steps aside and lets him take the reins. Julian Rush wants a Sophia that he can control. Everyone has only ever interacted with her to get something from her or craft her into something they want her to be. I'm not the one who's sick. 
the world is. Now, this perfectly echoes the mantra of all Batman media as of late. The true villain of Gotham City is Gotham itself. That most recently has been echoed in movies like Joker Folly Ado, where we see the sheer corruption and neglect that happens in Gotham City literally create the iconic villain, the Joker. The systemic issues within Gotham City have always been the problem, and like the more modern Batman films, are actually making that point within their story. Yes, they have psychotic Zodiac wannabes, blowing up bridges or insane clowns in prison, but the antagonist of the story at its root is the lack of care in the city. Again, Joker being a phenomenal example, as well as this series. So now we see Sophia back in the present day wearing a yellow dress. Now, you would think that we'd see her wearing the yellow dress in the flashbacks prior to her time at Arkham when her life was more joyful, and you would think that she'd be wearing the red dress from the flashbacks now after she's been broken and covered in blood, both literally and figuratively. Yellow, of course, represents things like joy, peace, and resolve. And while Sophia has been broken, Haas's portrayal, I think, was the final nail in the coffin for her to reach a state of, well, bliss. Sure, Bliss could be represented by the color red, considering the drug Bliss is red, but I love the choice of yellow to show that Sophia is no longer burdened by the lies, the manipulations, the torture, and everything else that she has been put through. Sophia now knows who she is and what she has to do to achieve her goals. This blissfulness and peace is echoed in her joyous demeanor as she prances around the mansion following her brutal killing of the entire Falcone household. We also see that she is no longer wearing a scarf or a choker to hide her neck scars. She has fully embraced who her father wanted her to be. If it's the hangman they wanted, it's the hangman they're gonna get. I also like the little nod back to the beginning of the episode where she again says, Forgive me, I've never been one for speeches, but I did want to say a few words. Sophia says, Convicted of murdering Summer Gleason, Taylor Montgomery, Yolanda Jones, and Trisha Becker. Now, none of these names are in the comics, but I think this is a crucial character moment for Sophia. Not only was she not the killer of these women, she made it a point that even through those 10 years, she would remember every single name of the victims of her father. When she said the line in the last episode, danced on my father's grave, she wasn't playing it up for Tao. She truly was elated to hear her father had gotten what he deserved. Get what you you deserve! I trusted you. I loved you. And yet not one of you tried to help me. Now, this calls back to Rush's line where he says, I'm here to help you, Sophia. I have no other agenda than that. Sophia was so desperately looking for anyone to see her side, and yet no one in the family, the family that prides itself on being there for one another and being a Falcone, none of them were willing to stand up against Carmine, even if that meant betraying Sophia. And then, of course, this episode ends with the song Strange Little Girl by The Stranglers, which on so many levels works so well. The song is about the strange little girl running away from home because it was just too much to handle and far too rough. This is the arc that we're seeing Sophia in now. She was groomed to be this perfect Falcone, then rehabilitated to act the exact way that would please the family. And now this strange little girl is running from that family name and making a name for herself. But she's doing that by becoming pretty much just as bad as her own father. The episode opens right after Vic and Oz's escape following the Moroni's ambush in episode 3. Once again, we're under an overpass showing us the dark and gritty underworld of Gotham. We see the damage on Oz's car from Vic's rescue as Oz recounts the tale he told Alberto. I ever tell you about Rex Calabresi? Now remember, Oz started his journey on this show waxing poetic about Calabresi and how he wishes to be revered in the way Rex was. Can you imagine? to be remembered like that. Oz wants to emulate Rex, and by telling Vic about this, he is trusting him with his dream. He told Alberto, who laughed at him, but he trusts Vic to respect his ambitions. So as they're burning Oz's car, Oz tells Vic more about his childhood hero, mentioning how his car was a chariot. Riding in on a chariot can signify a lot of things, but with Rex's notorious reputation, this metaphor is a symbol of power. Kings, warriors, and even the Greek god Apollo are oftentimes portrayed riding in on their chariots. This imagery not only commands respect, but it is also a display of power. Oz told Alberto and Vic about how Rex could make a kid with a bum leg feel like even he could be king. And this is why Oz reveres Rex. So as we've seen in previous episodes, Oz 
is quick to brush off his disability. But then Rex Calabrese, a man who was paraded through the streets, made him feel not only welcome, but powerful, which is life-changing for someone like Oz. Oz wants to be respected like Rex, and he's telling Victor because he's trying to be the same kind of role model for Vic as Rex was for him. He wants Vic to see him the way he saw Rex, and Oz sees himself in Victor. So with that comparison in mind, Oz burning his car, his chariot, symbolizes a new era. Rex riding in on his chariot showed us his power and respect, while Oz in his burning chariot evokes the same power and respect, but with two outcomes, absolute destruction or ascendance to another level. Oz is at a crossroads. When Vic asks about their betrayal of Sophia, Oz brushes him off, saying that the chick, but you won't matter. Now, while we know just how untrue this is, it really just proves how how right Sophia was last episode telling Oz, you have a dick, so at least you're eligible for a promotion. Even after he's seen how capable Sophia is of ruining lives, he still has the gall to cast her aside simply for being a woman. Now, Oz and Vic have this great moment here where they open up to one another about the importance of loyalty. Put your ass on the line for me. 100 Maseratis couldn't replace that. This shot shows us how they are mirrors of one another. Vic sees himself in Oz just as much as Oz sees himself in Vic. And while Oz values Vic's loyalty overall, it does make me question where Vic's character is going. If the two are complete mirrors of one another and Vic is Oz's driver, who's to say Vic won't betray him like Oz did Sophia? The framing of this shot is also brilliant storytelling. Vic and Oz are under the awning, out from the rain and out of the flames. They're on the cusp of being in too deep. The fire, which they set, is away from them. They are clear of destruction they've caused. It's raining heavily, but isn't extinguishing the flame, symbolizing that nothing can stop what they've already put in motion. So when Oz whipped out TikTok, I actually laughed out loud. I, I know we had a live streamer Riddler in the Batman, but something about the penguin having a TikTok is especially funny. And it makes you wonder what his For You page looks like. I'm assuming a lot of Screen Crush videos. Check us out, TikTok. So the post he pulls up is from Taj Maroney, Sal's son. Take a look at his username, View from the Taj, what I assume to be a play on his own name, Taj, with the actual Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal, of course, being a monument of love and is a symbol of beauty and perfection. And the saying view from the Taj could metaphorically mean seeing life through a perspective of love and appreciation. So Penguin calls Taj a huge blind spot just begging to be exploited. This line shows how the Penguin, the Maronis, and the Falcons all have contrasting livelihoods. The theme of this episode is family. There's always room for family. Specifically what it means to be a family during a gang war. Taj and Sophia are both heir to their family's money and notoriety, but they are behaving as opposites. Sophia doesn't let the notion of family hold her back from slaughtering everyone, while Taj is standing up for his family. So while the Falcons may hold a lot of pride for their family name, the Maronis prove that their enemies are phonies. So Oz threatens Taj with a gun and Taj goes full Draco Malfoy on him. My mother, my father, they won't, they won't stand for me. Oh, about this. So later Oz shows them a classic kidnap victim photo with the daily paper as proof of life. And their reactions show the stark difference between these two families. The Falcons say that they're all about family, but they are quick to backstab each other. Carmine threw Sophia in jail for a decade because she questioned his judgment. When leaving Blackgate, Oz sees the news about the Falcons and man, could he have not been more wrong earlier. She won't matter. He knows now that Sophia might be out of the way but the hangman is only getting started. Once again, showing us that Sophia was not originally the hangman, but them accusing her and framing her to be the hangman is actually what created the hangman with her time in Arkham. Now, notice how Sophia is not hiding behind chokers or scarves anymore. We mentioned that last episode as well. Her scars are now exposed for the world to see. She is embracing her inner hangman. She has become the very thing her father wanted her to be. In the last episode, episode, Sophia only spared Gia and Johnny. Johnny was only spared for personal gain, while Gia was spared because she's an innocent child. So now Gia is out of the house and taken to a child services home where she's safe from the family. This shows us that, yeah, Sophia may be a vicious killer, but she knows what it's like for a little girl in the family and she wants to spare Gia from the same suffering. It also shows us that while Sophia might be going kind of crazy, she does have somewhat of a moral barometer and isn't looking to kill anyone that she views as innocent 
innocent, such as an innocent child. She is simply set on revenge against those who made her into this monster. So the officer that speaks with Sophia is Chief Mackenzie Bach from the Batman. In that film, he was opposed to Batman as a vigilante, but it wasn't confirmed that Bach was on Falcone's payroll. His comic counterpart makes me feel like we can actually trust Bach. This show takes a lot of inspiration from the great comic No Man's Land. She said it's like a no man's land now or something. The comic follows a fractured Gotham after it suffers a massive earthquake and through the thick of it, Bach backs Jim Gordon in every choice he makes to put Gotham back together. He's one of the few good cops left in the city. So Bach refers to her as Miss Falcone, which Sophia is quick to correct. Please, I prefer Sophia. She is completely divorcing herself from the family name. Like she said last episode, So tomorrow I am starting a new life. So when Sophia takes off Johnny's gag, he says, <laughs> Calling back to what Carmine told Sophia the night she was catered off to Arkham. You're confused. Uh, sick. In both scenes, Sophia's autonomy is at play. When she confronted Carmine, she was standing up for herself and questioning her father's morality. Here, she is finally taking her life into her own hands. Anytime she's tried to fight for herself, men have labeled her as sick. So back to Oz, he is storing Taj in his girlfriend Eve's apartment. When Eve confronts him for placing herself and her girls at risk, he pulls his classic argument. And then it's you and me on top of the world. Last week, we talked about how Oz claims to act like everything he does is for us. Working with Sophia was for us. Betraying Sophia was for us. He finds a way to spin everything he does into a, a gift for others. Like putting Eve in danger is so she can live a happy life at the top. You'll also notice that Eve's living room light is an umbrella, a little nod to the classic penguin accessory. This shot between Oz and Eve is also framed really well. It's the first time that Eve and Oz are actually on different sides. Oz crossed the line. He put her girls right in Sophia's crosshairs and Eve is furious so she literally puts a barrier between herself and Oz. So back with Sophia in a final plea for his life we see Johnny tell Sophia you need me now Sophia mirroring Oz's initial plea to her in episode two. I owe you. Sophia was quick to call out Oz for assuming what she needs, something that everyone keeps doing to her, but she can see that Johnny will actually be useful. In that episode, she called Oz her little helper, which is exactly what she plans to use Johnny for. For so long, Sophia has been the one being used, and now she's flipping the script. So when Vic arrives to look after Oz's mom, the 1980 crime thriller Gloria is playing on TV. The film follows a former gangster's girlfriend as she protects a young kid from the mob. Now, aside from the general mob vibes, this movie does show a lot in common with the Penguin. Both showcase a tough, morally ambiguous character taking care of a younger kid. And thematically, Gloria underlines the theme of this episode and the thin line between friend and foe in a gangster world. Think about how much alliances have shifted in just five episodes. We went from Oz and the Falcons to Oz and the Maronis to Oz and Sophia to Oz and no one. And the same goes for Sophia with Johnny Vitti. And guys, this scene is heartbreaking. We already knew Oz's mom had dementia or some type of memory issues, but the reality of her sickness in this scene is truly upsetting. Within Vic's walk from the bathroom to the kitchen, there are at least 13 post-it notes with a mix of reminders like buy coffee or what her favorite radio station is, but also more simple reminders like where her cups are. The stove is on, the fridge is wide open, providing further proof that she's not all there and echoing back to what her landlord said earlier in the season. Yo creo que va a ayuda permanente. Now when Vic enters her room, we see do the dishes on a note by the door. She's clearly just writing down whatever she manages to remember throughout her day. And later when she leaves her room, we see lock door on another note. This is a once capable and headstrong woman grasping for any of her past personality and strength. She wants a better life for herself, but regardless of where she moves to, penthouse or suburbs, Francis is slipping away minute by minute. And if it couldn't get sadder, she asks Vic, you remember this? She thinks he's one of her sons. And man, did Deidre O'Connell steal this episode. When she snaps out of her episode and goes right back into joking with Vic, you can see the real Francis Cobb shining through, especially when Vic starts talking business. She is attentive and knowledgeable, pointing out how he's waking them to get at the Falcons. 
They're the bigger fish. So Francis knows the happenings of the crime world in Gotham. She's aware of the Maronis and the Falcons feud. And we see that this is a brilliant woman who is bogged down by a life ruining disease. When Francis asks about Oz, Vic lies and says that Oz killed all of the Falcons because he knows that's what she wants to hear and probably what Oz would like him to tell her. We've seen that she holds Oz to a very high standard. This city is meant to be yours, sweetheart. And we know that Vic understands the pressures of pleasing your parents as we saw in episode three. My dad would be ashamed of me. And so he embellishes for Oz. Now at Blackgate Penitentiary, we see Sal shrine to his family with a photo of him and Nadia front and center. Once again, showing us that the Maronis are actually family oriented as opposed to the Falcons. Sal, though a crime boss and a brutal gangster, will always put his family first. After a classic shootout, Oz flicks on his lighter and sets Nadia and Taj ablaze, literally burning all of the evidence of that night outside the apex with Sophia. The car and the Maronis are all burnt to ashes, erasing everything that is in Oz's way to power. Like the Phoenix, he is literally emerging from the ashes to stake his claim. And we have another brilliant framing moment here. Sophia said that with these mushrooms they would paint the town red a double entendre for both the drugs and the blood that would be spilling into the streets of gotham sophia may have sparked the beginning of this battle but oz has just lit the fire to this all-out drug war now the song playing here during their escape is by the police and the nonsensical title is actually the whole point of the song showing how absolute nonsense and blabber can easily get people to listen. It's about how words can be easily used to manipulate people. And we see that here in every aspect of the show and the Batman universe at large. We saw it with the Riddler and corrupt politicians, with Sophia, and we see it constantly with Oz. So as they drive away, we see an old Don Mitchell Jr. poster from his campaign with a Riddler insignia spray painted over it, showing even though the Riddler is in Arkham, he devastated the city and his mark still leaves a shadow over Gotham. So in a way, even though Riddler is locked away, he still kind of won. And then of course we see another Stop Drops billboard here showing the absolute hypocrisy of the Gotham elite. Mitchell and his fellow upperclassmen all use the drug at 44 below. And then if Oz's luck couldn't get any worse, the mushrooms, save for two buckets, are ruined from the fire extinguisher. But that's not all. Sal Maroney is back on the playing field. There's no place I can't find you now. As Oz panics and calls Vic, we can see more missing persons posters blurred out in the background. It's almost a metaphor for the the current state of Gotham. The people actually affected by the Riddler's attack are left to fade into the background, while the manipulative power grabbers like Oz crawl their way into the spotlight. Once again, Oz abuses his power over Vic during this call. She's Vic, how is she? Two episodes ago, Oz called out the waiter for interrupting Vic. The man was speaking. Let him finish. And later that episode, he did the same thing. Jesus, kid! Oz started off this episode by commending Vic for his loyalty and putting them on equal footing. It's you and me now, kid. Till the end. Only to tear it all away once again when he feels threatened. At the Falcone Mansion, Sophia is in her mother's room. Her entire hangman trauma stems from that night in this room when she found her mother hanging. She relived this night every night while she was in Arkham. Everything hangman that has happened to her happened within the confines of these walls. This whole episode is about ending eras and starting something new. Sophia is reclaiming not only herself, but the room that haunted her from her youth. And then it's revealed that her mother's maiden name is Gigante, which is Sophia's married name in the comics. So Sophia is killing it as the dawn of the family. No wonder Carmine wanted her to replace him in the first place. She she opens the meeting by admitting, I gassed the family. With Julian watching on in pride. And this is a major 180 from the Arkham flashback with Sophia screaming her innocence. I told you I'm innocent. The score here echoes back to the Batman's theme. Expendable. Sophia is not the hero that the Falcons need, but she is the one they deserve. Last episode, Carmine's theme was a slower version of the Penguins. But I know that I, you know, I, I know that I, I, I... 
showing how Oz is the new flashier version of Carmine Falcone. And guys, the writing in Sophia's monologue is amazing. I am a gigante. In the comics, her snap was from gigante to hangman, all because of the death of her father. And they've reversed that to show her turn from hangman to gigante in spite of her father, the actual hangman. Yeah, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. And I guess Soul Survivor, apart from Gia, Johnny Vitti, could really only last for so long, and it seems only fitting that he is the first to die in this new family. I mean, he even admitted earlier, The second I do what you want, you can kill me. And plus, he was the first to die in Batman The Long Halloween, a comic we've referenced several times throughout our breakdowns of this series. So now I want to take a second to talk about all of this happening at the table. So their war room coincides with their dining room, and as the saying goes, You don't that we eat. So a little over 24 hours earlier, the whole Falcone family was sitting down for a meal, and now there is literal blood and money all over the table. The dinner table is normally a symbol for home, stability, and family, but now it's been tainted with blood, literally and metaphorically. Sophia has now erased everything that represented family within the Falcones and has successfully started anew as a gigante. And this shot is just wow. It perfectly represents the show's theme and social commentary. Sophia, the dawn of the most prolific crime family, standing front and center while the lower underlings of Gotham reach for actual bloodstained money, while her hands stay clean. So Vic is taking Francis to Crown Point, and you can see why Roxy dubbed it a no man's land. They are still beat up from the flood at the hands of the Riddler. Once again, you know, a reminder that while the Riddler claimed to want to take on the upper class and the elites, what he did really hurt the impoverished. Anyway, we see random planks of wood, rolled up carpet, and grime everywhere. You can even see the water line from where the flood came up to the buildings. Cars are flipped on top of one another, a whole power line is down on the ground. This area of the city has received no help since the flood. It's a stark contrast to the pristine ground of the Falcone's mansion we just saw seconds ago. Here we can see a real change and a We Are Gotham poster solidifying the dichotomy between the city's response to the crisis and to the town itself. Those posters are trying to promote belief in change, while the people are surrounded by constant reminders of the disaster that was forced upon them. And this whole scene really emphasizes the connection to the comic crossover No Man's Land. In the comic, following the earthquake, the people of Gotham were cut off from the rest of the world. Isolated, they did anything they could to survive. Hunting, gathering, bartering, fighting, and we see that here. Someone is crouched down by a fire trying to stay warm. Others are using a shopping cart to pick up any goods they can find. For instance, this is Squid, the small town mobster from the comics and who we saw in episode three. He's stealing whatever he and his crew can find in the wreckage of Crown Point. This, again, is much like the No Man's Land comic with different gangs and rogues claiming different areas of Gotham following the disaster. And remember, we saw No Man's Land slightly adapted in the film The Dark night rises. And hey, fun little thing we noticed about Squid, he has Squid tentacles tattooed on his hands. Now Vic is taking Francis to his old friend Calvin's apartment to keep her safe, and don't worry, they don't have to worry about Calvin showing up anytime soon because, well. No way. Now, Vic and Mrs. Cobb don't want to be anywhere near here. Vic has his trauma from the night the Riddler attacked his hometown, and Francis clearly has some trauma from her time living in Crown Point. She says to Vic that the city, it takes everything from you, mirroring what Sophia said to Julian last episode. I'm not the one who's sick. The world is. Now, whatever side of the drug war you're on, everyone knows the true enemy of the people is Gotham City itself. There are so many systematic issues, the prison system, class disparity, mental health services, everything in Gotham is just bad. And all of this helps you understand the criminality of these people in The Penguin, The Batman, and even Elseworld movies like The Joker. When Oz goes to get Eve, he has another one of his little temper tantrums. Can I can watch you no more? Huh? Oz values loyalty above all else, praising Victor in the beginning. You came back, Vic. And now that Eve doesn't want to uproot her life because of his mistake, he feels like she's turning against him. Oz wants to be the king that Rex was, and losing one follower feels like the beginning of the end for him. And then we see Sal sitting at his dining room table and crying over a picture of Nadia. Now, compare that to the actual blood that Sophia split on her dining room table. And we can see the true differences between the two 
two families. Instead of immediately trying to get back at Oz, like Sophia would have, he instead is grieving the loss of his family. This also shows us the stark difference between Salvatore Moroni and Carmine Falcone. So Sophia's confrontation with Sal is perfect. She respects Sal's sentimentality for his family and even admires him for it. Your family had it right. I think. Something that Carmine was never able to understand. Now, at the end of the day, Carmine Falcone was the foil to the Falcone family, like Sophia said. The Falcones don't exist anymore. That name and the Empire died with Carmine. Now Sophia forming an alliance between the Gigantes and the Moronis, it's a big deal. She's not just dancing on her father's grave anymore, she is building her own empire on top of it. So when Oz comes to Crown Point to check in on Vic and his mom, he immediately apologizes to Francis. I'm sorry, Ma. I feel like I let you down. Now, like we said, this episode is all about family. Family. The bond between family members, the strength it gives you, and in Oz's case, the guilt he feels about his mother. He knows he's the only person left in that family that can take care of her, and it crushed him to bring her back to the one place on earth that she doesn't want to be. Now, the only time we ever really see a true genuine side to Oz is with his mother. The way that he talks to her is like a little child trying to make up for getting in trouble. He's even cuddling her and holding her arm like a toddler who's in need of comfort. Everything Oz does is in hope for some type of validation or love, and we see that stems from right here here with him and Francis. Francis calls Oz, my boy, with such big dreams. Because that's not only what she sees him as, but what he is. Miss Cobb sees Oz as her baby, but now she feels like that's all it is, just dreams. Oz is never going to amount to the lifestyle that he's promised his mother, and her disappointment in him will further his path toward destruction, as he'll go scorched earth on Gotham to please her. Well, Oz responds with, I ain't like him. The Rex that Oz promotes to everyone is a very subjective take on Rex. In the comics, his nickname was The Lion because he would scar people with lion teeth. So while Oz talks about how fantastic of a man he was, we know that there's another side to the story. When Vic asks Oz about what happened to his brothers, Oz says, City took him, just like it took your family. Harkening back to Francis's quote earlier in the episode, It takes everything from you. While Oz isn't talking about the flood that killed Vic's family, he is talking about the evil in Gotham that has been and will forever be present. It doesn't matter if it's a flood, explosion, fire, or shooting, Gotham comes for everyone in the end. And then we get arguably the most heartbreaking line in this episode and the jumping board for why Oz is doing this. I was uh, too weak. Oz is ashamed and even haunted by his disability. Oz has spent his whole life as the kid with the bum leg. The only thing he fears more than losing those he loves is the fear of being seen as that weak child again. And that is what kicked off this whole show. Alberto saw him as weak and Oz lost it. His fear of being seen as vulnerable or weak has led to every bad decision he's made in his life. Oz treks back to the trolley yard with Vic. They're both literally and figuratively going deeper into the darkness of Gotham. Oz sparked the fire at the beginning of the episode and now he's going into the depths of hell to claim his crown in the city. When Oz is walking in the tunnel, he pauses at the Gotham City water panel. Now, if you know anything about Batman, something is always up up with the water supply. And Batman begins, Ra's al Ghul and Scarecrow plan to poison the city using the water supply from underneath Wayne Tower. This would be the fastest way to get the entire city addicted to the drug Bliss. Oz then turns the generator on for their new lair and I can't help but be reminded of Batman Returns with the Penguin and his underground lair. Oz says, Please. And I think this is going to be good for Oz and company. While he's at both the lowest point in his story and in Gotham, there's only one way to go from here. Now, with their new base of operations, the episode closes out with St. Vincent's Reckless, a song about how it feels to be unmoored by grief. That ties into both of the episode's themes about the importance of family and new eras. Sal is now joining forces with Sophia, two crime gods haunted by grief, but pushing forward to claim their empire, and Oz, who's coming right back home to face his ghost as he climbs up the ladder to the top. I mean, Sophia's the last of them. She don't even like a f 
name. So since Oz's betrayal, Sophia has been on a warpath of making her own name, distancing herself from the Falcons, and embracing her new self, Sophia Gigante, which, as we mentioned last week, is her actual name from the comics, and in this series, it is the maiden name of her mother. Now, in the previous episode, we saw Sophia correct Bach, saying, Please, I prefer Sophia. And one of her final lines in that episode was even, The Falcons don't exist anymore. So oftentimes the opening shots of this show are overpasses and we can see the crime happening beneath that line. This is symbolic of the literal Gotham underworld, the dividing line between the poor and the elite. We even saw this brilliantly portrayed by the flood lines on the buildings in Crown Point. Once again reminding us how the flood greatly impacted the poor and working class while the rich up in their ivory towers were mostly spared. Once again playing into the overarching theme of not only this series but Matt Matt Reeves Batman universe as a whole, class disparity. But in this opening shot, we're not only under an overpass, we are going below ground into literally the deepest part of Gotham. We're reaching a level of evil previously unseen. Now, Vic driving into the Penguin's Lair is the same framing and camera work as Bruce Wayne going into the Batcave in The Batman. This is yet another representation of our character's descent into hell. We're seeing a good kid like Vic fall further and further into the darkness that has infected Gotham City. This imagery of Vic going into Oz's lair juxtaposed with Bruce Wayne descending into his Batcave reminds us that Batman also lives in a hell of his own. His pain, his grief, his guilt, they're all haunting Bruce and they are the very things that created and fuel the Dark Knight. The darkness swelling in the belly of Gotham infects every Gotham resident, but the way it affects the individual can differ. Penguin and Vic have fallen into the more common path of crime, while Batman has taken this exact same torture and uses it to combat the darkness by embracing those inner demons in a far different way than Oz. But we also have to remember that unlike Vic and Oz, Bruce comes from a place of privilege, actually kind of similar to Sophia. Yes, Bruce has suffered great loss, but he's never wondered where his next meal would come from or where he'd be laying his head that night. Bruce was only able to avoid Gotham's corruption because he was given a head start in life. He's never been under that literal and metaphorical waterline, gasping for air and just just trying to keep his head above water. Oz and Vic, however, are drowning and trying to swim to the top while Bruce, more specifically the Batman, has dove from the heights of Gotham's elite down into the depths, hoping to pull that metaphorical drain stopper and save Gotham City from itself. And this is consistent with every iteration of Batman. The same social conditions of Gotham City that create Batman's greatest foes are the same conditions that created the Bat himself. So here the maps in the background are really similar to the section maps in the No Man's Man's Land comic where Oracle divided up Gotham by gangs. Oracle of course being the alias that Barbara Gordon takes on after being shot by the Joker in the Killing Joke comic. And she essentially becomes an informant for Batman. Now here we can see that the Odessa mob is marked uptown on the map. And as we've gone over previously, the Odessa mob, they're a Russian mob in Gotham who are ruthless drug pushers and they were heavily involved in the Great Gang War during Batman War Games. That's the comic that this episode is most heavily referencing. Now, Burnley Town Massive, aka the BTM, was another gang operating in Gotham in the town of Burnley. They also appeared briefly in the War Games arc, but were actually taken out by the aforementioned Odessa mob. This once again reminds us of the gang war going on in a show like The Penguin. Now, Oz then mentions the Low Boys, who are actually a smaller gang from the Batman No Man's Land comic. They have a rivalry with the gang Street Demons in that comic, both fighting for more land to claim in the post-Earthquake. Gotham. We've talked before how in the Batman we didn't get an earthquake, but we did get the Riddler's Flood, which we think is setting up for a No Man's Land type adaptation in the Batman 2. Now, Oz also mentions the Triads, who we did meet in Episode 3. They're a Chinese criminal organization from the comics, and there's two prominent branches in Gotham. The Neon Dragons, who we heard mention of in Episode 3. I can go to the Neon Dragons or the Odessa Mob. And the Lucky Hand Triad, who were the more involved party in the War Games arc. The group, addition had an alliance with the BTM against the Odessa mob. So Oz's worker Zeke says, the City Hall's rationing electricity, sending it all to the rich neighborhoods. And that goes hand in hand with all of the other help, or lack thereof, that comes to Crown Point. Now, in the previous episode, Oz mentioned how the politicians got greedy and diverted funds, thus cutting off the trolley. They were abandoned when I was a kid. Politicians got greedy. Divided funds. Even prior to the flooding, this area of Gotham has been left to its own devices without any 
hope of help. Oz says, They're so busy with the noses up, they'll never take the look down. I really love this line because this episode and this series as a whole is all about status and where you come from and how those economic differences can drastically affect the outcome of your life and your overall outlook on life. Sophia is filthy rich. Having her nose turned up signifies snobbiness. And this alludes to how Sophia will be too busy with her affluent world that she won't see the little guys like Oz and Vic who are taking her on from below, literally from below. Oz tells Vic, We got the loyalty, we got the love. Now, these are the two most important things to Oz. Everything Oz does is in the name of love. Whether it's genuine or not doesn't really matter as long as he feels validated and that the people he surrounds himself with are loyal. Sophia even makes fun of Oz later in the episode when she mockingly calls him the best. So Oz is happy that he is the guy in the neighborhood who takes care of people because that's exactly what Rex Calabrese was for him. He helped people. If someone in your family was sick, you find you a doctor. He was that guy in Oz's neighborhood. And Oz sees just how close he is to becoming just like his childhood hero. Oz tells Vic, We're gonna tell stories about us one day, kid. Now, last episode, Oz told Vic that it was you and me till the end. And while it's nice that he's continuing with that rhetoric, we know just how fast Oz can turn on those that he cares about. Now, this whole scene is happening in the mixed dining slash war room. Here we're seeing that Sophia is already conflating the family room with her less than holy work life. But now she's adding her love life in as well. The blending of both her professional and personal life highlights Sophia's blurred boundaries. She doesn't know where family fits in or where a healthy relationship fits in. Everything she's learned in life has been at this war table. Sophia has allowed herself to become this hangman facade that Carmine created, and she could be on the path to becoming just like her father. Now, it's also worth mentioning that in the previous episode, when Sophia was making her debut as the Don Gigante, the family portrait was removed from the room, but now it's back. It's almost as though Sophia wanted any reminder of Carmine Falcone out of the room until everyone understood that he would not be the focal point of their lives or that portrait from that point forward. Here we see that Sophia has a Kahlo book on the coffee table, Frida Kahlo is hailed as a feminist icon. Her work explores themes of personal identity and gender roles. This makes perfect sense for Sophia's character because Sophia Gigante was born from years and years of being forced into a perfect Falcone. She hid who she truly was at the behest of all the men surrounding her. Kahlo's work encapsulates everything that Sophia is now standing for, albeit in a more twisted fashion. Now, when we see Sal in the kitchen cooking, this is meant to serve as a metaphor for love. Cooking involves care of some level, and the time that you spend preparing the meal can symbolize the time invested in a loved one. Now, Sal cooking this food shows that he is willing to put in time and effort in whatever sort of partnership he now has with Sophia. Now, put that in contrast to where we saw Carmine in episode four. He wasn't cooking the food at the table, it was prepared. This shows us the passive relationship he really had with Sophia. It was artificial, it didn't come from love. He wasn't willing to put in that time. It was all showmanship presented for the family. And we're now seeing that contrasted with Sal, who is taking on the role of a father for Sophia, and Sophia is filling that void left behind from Sal's wife and son. Now, Sal also shares a glass of wine with Sophia, just like Carmine did the night before he betrayed her. Now, Sophia asks Sal if he needs help cooking. Do you want this chopped? Now, like we said, cooking is a metaphor for love, but cooking together? Not only is that showing love on some level, but it shows teamwork, trust, and communication. Sophia and Sal are able to relate and then connect. They both lost their families, and it really is the two of them against the world at this point, and they're helping one another move forward and against Oz. Now, at this point, it's difficult to pinpoint who exactly the villain is of this series when they're all so bad, yet simultaneously sympathetic. So Sal calls Oz, so the weed, the weed is sneaking around the city. Which is hilarious because Oz's operation is literally growing up from the underground and spreading throughout the city like a weed. Sophia says that Oz likes the spotlight too much to stay hidden, and she's right on the money. We saw it clear as day in the last episode with Oz telling his hitman to say, This is from Oz, motherfucker. He can't help but advertise himself, regardless of the trouble it could get him in. Remember, Oz revered Rex because he was a big deal. 
Oz wants the same amount of eyes on him that were on Rex, and he won't stop until he gets that big parade thrown in his honor. Now, Sal tells Sophia that he planned to pass the recipe down to Taj, showing that he really saw his family as just that, family. He didn't look at his son or his wife as pawns in the gang war. He planned to pass a loved family meal to his son. Now, contrast that to Carmine, who only planned on the future of the family business. He didn't care about Sophia or Alberto as his children, but just as future heirs. Now, here we can see them eating in the kitchen instead of the war room. Now, dinners with Carmine always had ulterior motives. The one dinner we saw ended up with them just talking about the family work. Meanwhile, this dinner with Sal only ended up with them talking about work as a way to get away from the pain of an actual dinner conversation. Additionally, Sal and Sophia are sitting next to one another. Neither of them are at the head of the table like Carmine always was. Sal and Sophia are genuine partners in this collaboration. Kind of reminds me of uh, Paulie's Diner, don't I? Now, Polly's Diner is actually from the game Arkham Knight. The name is a reference to the legendary Batman writer, Paul Dini. Now here we can see bodies hanging just like in the Dark Victory comic run, but now missing pinkies. This is an homage to Oz's handling of Alberto earlier this season. And this mixes the origins of the hangman in the comics with the origin of Sofia Gigante in this show. Remember, in the comics, Sofia received her father's pinky with a ring on it in the mail, but in this show, she received her brother's body missing his pinky and his ring. Now, Sophia in the comics went after everyone related to Harvey Dent in the case against her father, picking them off one by one until she got to Harvey. And she's doing that here as well, starting with the little guys. The hangman is almost a self-fulfilling prophecy at this point. She didn't intend to be the hangman, but she was framed, and in the end, the rumors will be proven true. Now, Oz says that the people of Gotham need to know that Bliss is in their hood. At this point, everyone knows Oz is the only person selling Bliss, and this is exactly what Sophia was talking about earlier. Oz likes the spotlight too much, regardless of the bad attention that it can gain him. Now, here we can see Oz's bookshelf is chocked full of useless magazines and seemingly unread books. His whole apartment, like everything about him, is an act. He's putting on a show of rich and glamorous, but those who truly are rich and glamorous can see right through him. Now, when Sal turns on the fireplace, we hear Sophia say, I know showing that the two were clearly thinking the same thing about his place being tacky. This is yet another reminder at how elites like Sophia and Sal look down on men like Oz who come from nothing. Or more importantly, they aren't looking down, they're looking up. And that's another example of them turning their noses up and remaining blind to Oz's actions below. He takes everything from me and he's got nothing. Now, this is the gist of Oz's relationship with everyone in this show. His mother even says so a scene later. I have given you everything. I have given you everything. Now, as much as Oz is a bad person, this comes from him growing up with nothing. If you're born with nothing, you're always going to be afraid that you'll die with nothing too. Oz grasps for everything he can get so that he can ensure he doesn't wind up right back where he started. Now, the song playing here is Put the Blame on Mame, the same song that we heard in episode one with Oz and Vic watching. Like we said in our episode one breakdown, this song was written for the classic noir film Gilda, which Oz references a second later. Like Gilda. Now, this song blames Mame for the three catastrophic events in U.S. history, as well as the fictional shooting of Dan McGrew. Like Oz says in that episode, She just escaped gold. Now, Oz asks Haiti, you don't want to be pals, and this is a reference to his blackmail letter to Haiti that he sent in episode one when he wrote the Let's Be Pals on the cover of that blackmail envelope. Now, both he and the Riddler have the same sentiment. They're both villains spawned out of poverty. They're trying to literally fight the system in the worst way possible. However, both of their fatal flaws are themselves. Riddler garnering a cult following and becoming an icon, and the Penguin solely helping the people of Crown Point to reach his end goal of being this small town hero. Both of these villains have genuine heart behind their anger towards the rich elite, but their selfish and nihilistic ways get in the way of anyone being able to sympathize with what they're preaching. Now, Sophia does have a moment here that reminded me of the Killing Joke comic, knocking on the door with her gun drawn, just like we saw the Joker do with Barbara Gordon. Next we hear, You were born an opportunity, honey, so you can afford to think in black and white. Matt Reeves' whole Batman crime saga is based on class warfare and the wealth disparity in Gotham. This episode is about how status in life pushes you toward what choices you make. 
Eve understands Oz because they both come from poorer areas and understand what it means to be the little guy. But she understands Sophia as well because they're both women, and no matter how wealthy or poor you are, you'll always be overlooked for being a woman. Eve asks Sophia, That's not who you are, right? And the score in this scene is really interesting. It has identical notes to the Riddler score, but it fades into the Batman score. Well, whatever I was born into. Almost as though we're seeing the real-time struggle of Sophia deciding if she's the hero or the villain. And I wanted to take a second to talk about how much I love the fact that Oz brought beers to his meeting with these other gangsters. Earlier in the episode, we saw Sophia and Sal sharing a glass of wine. Them sharing a glass of wine is meant to symbolize how they are more elite and fancy, while we see Oz cracking open some beers with his new partners, once again giving us the imagery that Oz is coming from a lower financial status and is more of a working man. Now, the man representing the BTM gang is Abel Crown. Abel is the leader of the gang in the comics as well, first appearing in Detective Comics issue 744. We then have the Sullivan crime family. Donnie Boy Sullivan is the one representing them, and they are from the Long Halloween comic run, and they were associates of the Falcons. In the Long Halloween, they're the ones responsible for a failed hit on Harvey Dent. And eventually, they're all taken out by Alberto Falcone. Next, we have mention of the Elliot Bridge, named after the Elliot family in Gotham. In the Batman, Edward Elliot, is the award-winning investigative reporter that broke the story about the Waynes and he was then murdered by Carmine. In the comics, the Elliots come from a line of wealth and are up there with the Waynes when it comes to money status. The Batman character shares a name with the great-grandfather of Thomas Elliot, aka Hush. Now next we hear Oz mention Gold Summit, which is the title of the episode. And this is their Gold Summit, gathering all of the gangs in Gotham to further their way to the top. Their summit on how to get their gold. Oz opens up about his crimes, mirroring Sophia talking about the family death in the last episode. I popped Alberto Falcone. Now, Oz does get the power back on in Crown Point, and I like that they're playing with comic lore like a puzzle. In the second half of the War Games arc in the comics, Oz causes a blackout in Gotham in order to monopolize power. But here we see the exact opposite of that. He's giving out energy only in return for loyalty and respect. And then we end the episode with Sophia finding Oz's mom and clutching a crowbar. This could perhaps be another Joker reference with a crowbar being a common weapon of the Clown Prince of Crime. In the comics, we saw Joker beat Robin to death with a crowbar, taking from Bruce the person he cared most about. Oz's mother is the person that he cares most about, apart from himself, but he also cares a lot about Vic, who we've said before in a previous breakdown that in many ways Vic is the Robin to Penguin's Batman. The parallels are actually pretty interesting. He's a troubled orphan that Oz takes in under his wing and trains in his line of work, just like Batman did for Robin. So Sophia taking away Oz's mom and then maybe even Vic would bring break Oz, or it could be the final push he'll need to become one of Batman's greatest foes. The title of the episode is Top Hat. Now this is a reference to Oz's favorite film that they watch later in the episode, but of course it's also a reference to one of the Penguin's classic comic accessories, his top hat. But there's actually a deeper meaning to this title. We've mentioned how the Cobbs are all about masking their actual status with the high society air. Oz's apartment, Francis's gown, all means to brush over who they actually are in favor of who they want to be. The 1935 film that shares this episode's title is about mistaken identities and high society life. This film is Oz's favorite because it's what he envisions for him himself in the near future. The theatrical set pieces and ballrooms are just as fantastical as what Oz and Francis are doing at the end. This high class life that they are living is no more than an act. So the opening song is called Islands in the Stream by Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers. The song is titled after the Ernest Hemingway book of the same name. This book is about a man who reflects on his life while on an island in the Caribbean. Metaphorically, however, it is about how we are our own individual islands in this stream of life. And how even in our personal isolations, we are still connected to those around us through that same stream. In relation to Oz and his mother, the stream is more so a stream of time. As Oz grows up and becomes his own personal island, he's still forever connected to his mother through that stream. Even through moments of distance, the connection between the two will always be a crucial part of Oz's character. It's the whole reason Oz is the way he is. Now, here we can see Miss Cobb looking at an invoice. Now, in the previous episode, she implies that her husband never pays the bills, saying, No! If you can't get the heat back on, 
I'll go to Rex. Now, it's clear that while Oz and his brothers were growing up, Francis was the main person that they had to rely on. Now, the Cobb's apartment is nearly identical to the layout of Calvin's apartment. Miss Cobb even says in episode five that it looks exactly like the apartment she had with her boys. This looks like the apartment I have my boys. I hate it here. Now, Miss Cobb calls Oz my big, strong bull of a boy, something that she still refers to him as in episode one. You're my big, strong bull of a boy. Now, when Francis begins to play with Jack and Benny, Oz has the same reaction he did in episode six to Francis complimenting Victor. Anytime his mother's love and attention isn't directly at him and him alone, something dark begins to stir within Oz. Now, the Cobb's apartment is very similarly decorated to Oz's current apartment. Now, while the apartment itself is low income and in a bad area of Gotham, it's chock full of trinkets and games and even a computer. Everything with the Cobbs is very surface level as long as it looks like they're affluent, they think everything is fine. And this show has been all about Oz finally going deeper than the surface with his literal and metaphorical descent deeper and deeper into Gotham and deeper and deeper into his life of crime. Now, when Oz sees Rex's car, he says, Damn. Look at those rims. Calling back to Victor trying to steal the rims off Oz's car in episode one. Here, Rex has a cigar, something that Oz is now seen with often. Rex, as we know, is Oz's childhood hero, so it makes sense that he'd emulate everything he does. So here we are seeing the real Rex versus the one that Oz loves and really has created in his own mind. Oz says in the first episode, you know everyone's name, so. We see that that is true here. He asks his crew if they know Francis Cobb's son, but for an entirely different reason, reason than what Oz had originally implied. That reason being that they were all under his thumb. He didn't know their names out of care, he knew them out of business and self-preservation. Now, on the side of a building, we can see a D.A.R.E. poster advertising for people to stay away from drugs. This represents what Francis says later. Drugs is drugs. Now, this flashback to the 90s shows the same issue that Gotham is dealing with now. Back then, they had a D.A.R.E. campaign, and now it's just rebranded as Stop Drops, the name of the drugs from the Batman and this show. Now, here we can see Wayne Tower in the background, high above the entire city, reminding us that the Waynes are part of that elite and corrupt group of Ivory Tower people. But it being the tallest building also echoes the themes of the Batman watching over the city of Gotham. It's really almost as if this spectrum that Gotham exists on is a bit of an Ouroboros. The tail and the head are connected. If you descend far enough into Gotham's depths, both literally and metaphorically, you'll find yourself at the top, like Oz. And the same is seemingly true for Bruce Wayne. If he goes high enough into the skies of Gotham, both as an elite and as the bat, and as the man with a very high moral standard, such as not killing, Bruce's ascension, like Oz's descension, has them on a crash course for collision. And that is true for so many of Batman's heroes and villains. Like in The Dark Knight, we hear the Joker say, To them, you're just a freak. Like me. Now here we can also see the La Caron restaurant that we saw in episode three, again showing the mirror between Vic and Oz's childhood origins. Now this train is going to Gotham Heights, a far less crime ridden area than the East End. Now during the No Man's Land comic run, Gotham Heights became a bit of a safe haven for the refugees who lost their homes during that earthquake that wrecked Gotham City. Now here Oz picks up the token that we saw in the bin of the boys room things that we saw in episode five. Now this is the first time in this episode that we hear the ping Theme. Screw you guys! It comes in right after Oz feels offended by the difference between his brother's physical abilities and his own. Once again, showing us that Oz is an animal of cowardice. The second he felt as though his brothers were picking on him because of his disability, the penguin rears its head. He's a monster in these instances, and he sees all of his actions as defending himself rather than harming others. When people call Oz the penguin, they are making fun of the way he looks and the way he moves. Oz has associated that name, the penguin, with negative negative emotions because they are picking on him. So Oz never wanted to be referred to as the penguin, yet now here he is acting on those same negative emotions that he's always associated with that name. And Sophia never wanted to be the hangman, but now here she is going in her father's footsteps and the Falcone family. So in the origin comic, Penguin Pain and Prejudice, Oz murders his brothers as well for the attention of his mother, whom he had a similar relationship with as he does in this series. 
His mother was the only person who showed him any form of compassion, and he would turn to dark and violent tendencies to win over her affection, something that he learned from his father. Now, in that comic, his brothers ridiculed and made fun of him because of his appearance and love for birds, and they actually go as far as to attack their brother and his pet birds. Oz then secretly murders all of them one by one, even murdering his own father just for the attention of his mother, the only one who actually cares about him. But in this series, Oz really is painted as just a selfish, jealous, downright evil person who killed his brothers who were actually portrayed as decent kids that loved their brother. Now, this song is Only You by Yazoo. This song is about the separation from a past relationship and reflecting on both the pain of separating and the hope of rekindling. However, in this context, it's more of a promise from Oz to his mother and vice versa. Oz believes that he is the only thing his mom needs. He feels little to no remorse for separating from his brothers, and he's now looking towards the future of it being only him and his mom. So Francis drives Oz off and comforts him just like he did for her in the previous episode. This is exactly what Sophia was referring to later in the episode when she points out someone shaped him. Everything that Oz does is learned from his time with his mother. He knows what his mom wants because that's what he saw and heard his entire life. To promise me that she'll get me every goddamn thing I deserve. Now, when Francis asks where the boys are, Oz lies and says they went to see Beetlejuice. Now, this is kind of ironic because Beetlejuice is about dead characters who are trying to interact with the living, paralleling Oz's brothers who are gone, but still part of the narrative that he's making through his life life. Also, like the Matlins in Beetlejuice, these ghosts are still haunting the lives of Oz and Francis, living among them every day. Jack's downtown. That's all. This whole time. So he's gonna get it Jack's out. Jack's downtown. I think it's really cool that the first truly evil thing Oz did was kill his brothers in the depths of Gotham, and now we've seen that come full circle with Oz going back into those same depths. Please. Now, before Francis can continue to question Oz, Oz quickly says, Yeah, I made your favorite. This is something that Oz does often as a means of deflection. He's gifting his mother something to take her mind off the hurt that he has just caused. Just like he did with Sophia, Eve, Sal, everyone. It's a learned behavior from his childhood. Now, Miss Cobb mentions how she wants to live in one of these penthouses, which Oz says he promised her here. Told her I get her a penthouse. We're seeing how all of Oz's motivations lead back to Francis and the many promises he's made in order to keep her happy. Now, here in the background, we see a painting of a matador being impaled by a bull with their muleta laying on the ground. This painting is showing us the matador's downfall, the loss of control over the bull, and the consequences of arrogance. Oz is the matador in this painting. He has instigated the bull over and over again, and he is now facing the music. He is now facing the consequences of his own actions. His own pride has become his downfall, something that we've actually noted previously. Additionally, the muleta on the ground is a symbol of Oz's loss of power. The muleta is the tool for controlling the bull, and with it being on the ground, it implies a loss of power and control. Now, here we can also see Jack's baseball mitt on the table, and the picture that Frances has hanging in her house of the boys is also on the table in the background. Now, the film that Oz picked to watch with his mom is the 1935 movie Top Hat, a musical comedy about mistaken identities. It's most famously known for its dance numbers starring Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, who Francis mentions later on in the episode. I'll be tap dancing on your grave like Ginger. Rogers. Now, this scene is edited together brilliantly. The toys in the background are shown drowning in the buckets of rain, showing the audience the horrific ends of Benny and Jack without being over-the-top gruesome and showing two kids drown. And I think that is just yet another perfect example of how much attention and care this series was given. It is a truly, truly, just really well-made show worthy of that HBO brand because, yeah, they could have gone the easy route and shown the kids gasping for air and drowning, but having just a shot of that closed door in the sewer and hearing them crying for help, that is just so well done and echoes what we're seeing with Oz. He descends into that same door later on, going deep into the depths of Gotham, and it's almost as if he is crying for help as well. So back in episode five, Oz says that his brothers were taken by the city. City took them. Which is technically true, but in that episode, Oz follows that up by saying, There was nothing I could, I was uh, too weak. 
Now, while Oz lied about just how exactly his brothers died, he is honest with his emotions. He felt weak in that moment with Jack and Benny. He thought they were making fun of him and his weakness spun into something darker, leading to his brother's ultimate demise and reminding us why Oz can go so dark when he thinks he's being made fun of, like in the first episode of this series when he kills Alberto Falcone for laughing at him. Now, Sophia is keeping Miss Cobb in Carmine's office, and as much as she tries to distance herself from her father and every Everything that came with being a Falcone, she winds up in the same spot as Carmine, just like last episode. She is fulfilling exactly what her father saw for her, like she says, He put me in an institution, and the second I got out, I walked right into another. Now, this series has handled both Oz and Sophia so well, and I love how Sophia is realizing that the villain her father wanted her to be has come full circle. Now, when Sophia confronts Francis, she says that she can't wait to tap dance on her grave, calling back to this line about Carmine's grave. And as soon as I had the chance, I danced on his grave. Now, last week we talked about how Francis is genuinely knowledgeable in the life that Oz leads. She knows the ins and outs of the crime world. He's waking them to get at the Falcones. They're the bigger fish. And we see that here. She can hold her own against the hangman. She even trips up Sophia a couple of times. What are you gonna do next? Dye your pink? Get an ass tattoo? I'll teach your daddy a lesson. Francis, despite her illness, can be just as ruthless as Sophia, and that ruthlessness has seeped into Oz during his childhood and made him into what he is today. Or is Oz keeping them locked up in some East side slum too. And I mean, she's technically not wrong. I give it to you, you got me there. Right. Now, Francis has another episode and name drops Oz's father. It's for Christ's sake, that's your job, ain't it? Now, in the comics, Aiden is actually the name of one of Oz's twin sons, who Oz kills with his umbrella in the 2024 Penguin comic run. Now, Sophia is once again in the kitchen instead of the war room. We are spending much more time in the untainted areas of the mansion rather than the room so deeply entrenched with everything Carmen Falcone represented. Now, after Sal bursts into Penguin's operation, he tells Oz that he's just like a sewer rat. Just like a sewer rat. Which Penguin heavily protested against being labeled in the Batman. I ain't no rat! If anything, he's more so. Penguin Man, the sewer. Now, when Sal dies, Oz says, I beat you, Sal. You hear me? I beat you. Mirroring his reaction in the Batman. but also emphasizing his ego problem. The first time he tried to kill Sal, he told the guard to say, this is from Oz. His need for notoriety never ceases. Oz is even disappointed to see Sal die so quickly because he wanted his moment to gloat about winning. Now, the showrunners have said how we're not supposed to like Oz by the end of this series, and this episode really cements that. Between this monologue and the interaction between Sophia and Francis, we can see clearly that it's not just, I got a bum line. Leg. No father. But those things don't make you a monster. Oz is the evil in Gotham. As much as his mother, his environment, his economic situation can aid in making him a villain, we see that in this interaction, he is truly evil down to the core. All he cares about is being at the top and making the little guys know it was him that got him there. Now, here we get a full circle moment where Oz takes the Falcone ring off of Sal, the ring that started the series with Alberto showing it off in the first episode. This is power, right? And that spurred this whole gang war in Gotham. Now that ring has finally returned to Oz, who is no longer pawning it off to the big guys like Sal, but wearing it for himself. It's his show now. He is the big bad. Here we can see Brookside Children's Home, and it's a stark contrast to the Gotham orphanage where Riddler grew up, again showing us the difference in treatment to the upper class and the lower class. Gia is in a very interesting situation in context of the message of the Riddler and the series as a whole. The Riddler monologued about how Bruce Wayne wasn't technically an orphan because he had money. Now, while Gia also comes from an affluent family, she's confined in these four white walls and stuck to live in her loneliness. Now, while it's not as traumatic as the Riddler's growing up was, it's nowhere near what a child should live in. And we see that emphasized with the cuts between Arkham and Brookside. Now, the relationship between Sophia and Gia is fascinating. Sophia, at one point in her life, was what Gia is now, shelved away and living in solitude, pushed away for being a problem. While Sophia did this as a means of help for Gia, she's doomed her to the foster care system for the rest of her childhood. Sophia has now fully become Carmine, and she really 
realizes that at the end of this visit. Now, when Sophia sees Gia's scars, she says, don't hurt yourself because of them. Advice that she's giving from experience, but also a mirror of what Oz told Vic in the beginning of the episode. Oz, I'm sorry. F*** your guilt! Both Sophia and Oz are telling these kids exactly what they wanted to hear during these points in their lives. These self-harm scratches on Gia also kind of mirror the scratches that Sophia did to her own neck. Now, Sophia confesses to Rush, I don't wanna be free. But a snap second later, she says, I want Oz to feel pain. We're seeing the Gigante Falcone fight in real time. Sophia wants to escape the burden that her father put on her, but it's all she knows and the only way she's ever coped with anything. She doesn't want to be involved with this life anymore. She's tired. She constantly feels the weight of Carmine looking over her shoulder, but it's the life that she's forced to live because she keeps bringing herself back into it. This whole conversation is even happening in the war room as opposed to the kitchen where she's been the last couple of scenes. Now, Sophia repeats Francis's sentiment of same winners, same losers. And we see this thematically with the score. Penguin's theme is a quicker, flashier version of Carmine's. Anything <laughs> you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. He's exactly like Carmine now, just a bit of a rebrand, and he even has the ring to boot. Oz has fully become like Rex. He believes that he's doing good. Last episode, talking about how he's the guy in the neighborhood who takes care of people. You know how meaningful that is, Vic? To be the guy in the neighborhood who takes care of people? Meanwhile, he's just inadvertently decimated an entire block. You could argue that maybe him and Rex are good in some subjective sense, dependent upon what they're doing, but in reality, they do more harm than good to the city. Now, when Francis is getting dressed up to make herself feel better, this calls back to episode 2 when she does the same thing in her apartment, dolled up in a sparkly dress and ignoring the world's issues. When she takes Oz dancing, she tells him, You have to promise me that you're gonna make something of yourself, that you'll get me every goddamn thing I deserve. And he replies, And I ain't gonna quit till I don't. And from the looks of this show, he's kept that promise. Everything Oz does has been to secure that goal that his mother instilled in him all those years ago. While Oz's nature is evil and greedy, he wasn't nurtured into anything better. If anything, he was groomed for the worst. Now, we've mentioned before how Oz is like the phoenix rising from the ashes to claim his throne, but it seems now that he's just bringing the ashes everywhere with him. This entire part of an already down on their luck town is now ruined, and who knows how many many have now died, how many are injured, and the only thing Oz cares about is getting himself out of the situation. For all of the distaste he has for the Riddler, they are one in the same. Now this is again Detective Marcus Wise, who we saw Sophia come to in episode 2 of the series, bribing him with the drops. Marcus is actually from the Robin comics, and much like his show counterpart, he was a corrupt member of the Gotham City Police Department. Now the closing song is a cover of You Really Got Me by The Kinks. This song is an anthem about being captivated by someone who really got you. In this context, however, I think it's more of an admittance. Sophia really got Oz this time. While he's the one usually pulling the rug out from under those he scams, it's Sophia who has the high ground this time. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! Okay, so we open with Dr. Rush doing the same EMDR therapy to Francis that he does to Sophia earlier this season. He's helping her remember the events following Oz killing his brothers. Now, in this flashback, we see Francis as her older self with her reflection being her younger self. So while this is a great way to show it's a flashback stylistically, it also has a deeper meaning. Oz's murder of his brothers has aged her tremendously. She's still the young and powerful Francis in the mirror, but everyone only sees her as the old and fragile Francis. When Francis walks into the hallway, we see that the boys' backpacks are still on the wall, based on what Oz told Sophia about that night in episode two. My mom, she, uh, she wouldn't get out of bed, you know, for weeks, maybe a month. Now, it's been a little bit of time since the boys have been confirmed dead. Like we've seen previously with the box of the boys' room items, Francis is holding on to the past. She is unable to move on. Okay, so Rex mentions Father Vincent. Now, this could be a reference to Father Vincent Strasberg from the fairly recent Batman comics, Gargoyle of Gotham. In that comic, he is this universe's equivalent of Killer Moth. Now, this scene really helps you understand how Rex could be seen the way that Oz sees him. Well, we saw last episode that Rex is really just a ruthless gang 
gangster, he did make a point to check on Francis and ask how she's doing. He even offered to pay for the boy's funeral. Now, while we know this is just because Francis is in his books, it's easy to see how a child like Oz could interpret this as caring. Francis says, As world has always been so goddamn needy. And this is an entirely different side of Francis from what we've seen thus far. In the first episode, Francis sets Oswald up, telling him, This city is meant to be yours, sweetheart. A line that comes into play later, but she essentially offers him the world. She doesn't tether his expectations, and we see now that that wasn't her delusion being played into, but instead it was Oswald's. She knows that he wants and wants and wants, and she's being honest about the greedy nature of her son. There's also the elements of Oz being disabled. Oz made it a point to say how important it was that Rex didn't look at him as the kid with a bum leg. He obviously didn't want to be seen as lesser or needy for his disability, but like Sophia said, I'm an east side kid, I got a bum leg, but those things don't make you a monster. Do they? This neediness isn't because of his physical ailment, it's the evil and the greed that is embedded in Oz. His yearning to be the only one in his mother's life, and Francis knows that. So Rex says, I bring in guys who are looking for a father. Which is why Oswald is hanging around him so much. His father doesn't pay him or his brothers any attention, but Rex gave Oz a chance, and this also mirrors Oz and Victor. Vic didn't start out looking for a father figure, but like he says at the end of the episode, you like family to me. Now, both Rex and Oz know that loyalty like that is unmatched. And if your goons look at you as a parental figure, you'll be more loyal than ever. Guys like that got to void the fill. They'll do anything for me. Now, this additional scene with Rex was so crucial to our perception of Francis. Last week, we said that she was the one glossing over their grief with glamour, but now we see that she is only doing that to please Oz and lure him in. Even at a young age, Oz only cares about the aesthetic of life. He doesn't care that his mother is grieving because of his actions. As long as she has a flashy dress and they're going out dancing, everything's fine. And he weaponizes this empathy with Francis later in Morose. He sees that she is rightfully upset and he says, I know you miss him, Ma. I do too. Leaving Francis stunned and upset while he goes right back to smiling and watching the show. Oz's perception of this night versus Francis's is also very interesting. Francis was dreading this night. This is the night she's planning to murder the only son she has left. Meanwhile, Oz is reminiscing to Sophia about how happy he was. We're going out, she says. I was thrilled. We danced all night. Francis says, Yeah, you sound like your father. Now, this is just like what she said to Oz in episode 5. Like your father. Both times, Oz vehemently denies this. I ain't like him. That ain't true. And it becomes clear why Francis hates the boy's dad. He's never there. He doesn't pay the bills. He lets Francis down at every turn. And her telling Oz that he sounds just like his father is the ultimate insult to him. He wants to be the only reason his mom is happy. And to hear otherwise really sets him off. He tells his mom, No one else believes in you like me essentially trapping her in his presence for the rest of her life. It's a major manipulation tactic from him and the same type of rhetoric that he fed Sophia. He went to Sophia saying, because it should be you in there calling the shots. And all of these other platitudes to boost her ego and confidence, but none of it ever meant anything. He's only telling Francis this because he knows she's slipping away from him. And this sentence imprisons her in his company. Oz then says, dance with me. The same way he cheered Francis up in episode two. Come on. Everything is now being put into proper perspective, and Oz dancing with Francis wasn't something he knew made her feel better. It was just the same tactic he had used before. Now, here we found a lot of cool stuff. We see a Don Mitchell Jr. poster with Thief spray painted over it, a reference to how he and all the other corrupt elites were using the Gotham Renewal Program in the Batman to earn money illegally through bribes and laundering. Next to that is a Riddler insignia with no more excuses, similar to the Riddler's no more lies statements throughout the Batman. And then we we see a protect or abuse anti-police poster on the wall referring to the several corrupt policemen in the Gotham City Police Department. This says Gotham's new face with a Riddler insignia again on the wall. Now this imagery around the rubble from the explosion represents why the Riddler's movement got so much traction in the first place. This was an area who was sick and tired of the abuse from the system and it just got absolutely devastated by a flood. Now later in the midst of a wreckage we hear a cop say, and we then hear a Gothamite reply, 
After the flood, these people received no help, and here they are yet again decimated by another major disaster. It's an endless cycle of loss for them, and the Riddler, who promoted change within the system, you know, he was seen as a god, and this new disaster will only further that movement. But the thing about Oz is that he's more competent than the Riddler. The Riddler caused chaos, and Oz seems like he wouldn't be much different, and it was hinted that Sophia would be the true heir to the Riddler movement to take that chaos and profit off of it. But with Oz outsmarting everyone and winning the war, it becomes clear that he is the one who can control this chaos in the aftermath of the Batman, which is exactly what was set up at the end of that film. And some will seize the chance to grab everything they can. So, Victor calls out the members of Oz's Gold Summit gang. Oh, a bunch of f***ing cowards, you know that? And it's a stark contrast to the Vic that we met in episode one. Please, please, please. Now, this is less of a note on Victor's character and more so on Oz and how much he is able to corrupt those around him. We see how he ruined Francis completely, and that was over a lifetime. And now, with the little amount of time he's had with Vic, he's managed to get him to bribe a cop, kill a man, and threaten the biggest gangs in Gotham to their face. Watch what you say. Are you going to catch a bullet? Now, here we can see that Sophia has her neck covered again. Following her rebirth as a gigante, she let the chokers and the turtlenecks go as a means of letting the hangman out. Though, after seeing Gia's situation at the orphanage, she realized that letting the hangman out was essentially letting her father out. She realized that she was becoming no better than Carmine Falcone. Now, we should also point out that Sophia is wearing these red Louis Vuitton shoes. Now, these are, of course, a luxury item and a symbol of power. Throughout this whole episode, she's worn some type of red accent, holding true to her statement of painting the town red. Find me a distributor and we'll paint the town red. So, when Sophia goes on to tell this story about the baby bird pushing its brother out of the nest, she can pairs Oz to that weaker bird. The smaller bird viciously attacked the bigger bird both being creatures who turned evil from their cowardice. And we should point out that this is essentially as close as Sophia was willing to get on calling Oz the Penguin, a name that she had previously defended him from, but now here she is literally comparing him to a weak bird. This whole scene is so fascinating. Oz says, You've done some though. And this is because he just cannot comprehend that he would be the one that's caused any of Francis's hardships in life. He's lived his whole life in this delusion that nothing Sophia does here will be able to change that. He goes as far as to even correct his mom saying You're getting things confused Oz cannot fathom being the one to have hurt Francis and Sophia's dynamic with Francis is also very interesting here she has a camaraderie with Francis now like she did with Sal and even Eve they've all been damaged by Oz she says just because somebody knows something doesn't mean that they don't need to hear it from the person who hurt them and she's not just talking about Francis at this moment she's talking about herself as well all Sophia has wanted from anyone is an apology. She told her family before she killed them, and yet not one of you tried to help me. She's wanted anyone she knows to take accountability to what they've done to her, and she's asking Oz to do the same for his mom. And here we can hear Carmine's theme playing. which is also interesting seeing as this is the only time in the episode that Sophia has her neck covered. When Sophia is back acting as a falcone hidden from her true self, Sophia is using the tools that she learned from Carmine to scare Oz. She knows that Oz won't find a gigante as intimidating as a falcone. So Frances has such a satisfying moment here when she comes to her truth. She wasn't bogged down by this illness or disease that Oz pushes she is. She herself has been tormented by suppressing this memory for the entire of her life. Oz has been the illness in her life, like she said. I got the devil in my house, Max. And I loved how Sophia is wanting to break Oz's bond with his mom, just like her broken bond with her father. And when she says, Why are you both so afraid? of the truth. Sophia, this entire series, has essentially been on a warpath to do away with the bullshit. So the bar next to Monroe's is called Bar 8, which is a bar from the comic Batman The Dark Knight. And this street sign reads Hill Street, which could be a reference to Hamilton Hill, the corrupt mayor of Gotham in the comics, shows, and video games, who first appeared in Detective Comics number 503. And we actually may have also heard mention of him back in episode 4. A wife of Congressman Hill. Now, the news reports of the explosion mirror the news reports of the Riddler's 
flood at the beginning of the series. It's a great way of showing how all of Batman's rogues, no matter how seemingly relatable they are, they are all the same evil. Oz holds distaste for the Riddler, but at the end of the day, they are both as devastating for Gotham, and they are both victims of that self-destruction that Gotham breeds. Now here we can see a road sign that reads Bristol Township, a more affluent area of Gotham from the comics where Wayne Manor actually resides. So it is clear now that Oz sees Victor just as he does everyone else, especially his mother. He doesn't tell Victor the whole truth, and he blames it on Sophia that she's the reason that he and Francis are now hurt. No matter how many times he'll consider Vic his equal and tell him it's you and me Vic till the end kid, as we know, it will never be him and Vic till the end. Now, despite Oz not considering Vic his equal, him and Vic are very similar here. Link told Vic earlier that it's not about the penguin, it's about the drugs. And here Vic is telling Oz the exact opposite. Oz, it's not just about the drugs. Vic has learned to be just as cunning and manipulative as Oz. Vic's speech to Oz also shows how someone like Rex can turn into a personal hero for a guy like Oz. Vic notes how Oz helped the East End more than any politician, and he praises him for all of his good work in the neighborhood, exactly how Oz describes Rex to Alberto in episode one. He was a big deal. He's in my neighborhood. He helped people. Now, despite both Rex and Oz being terrible, corrupt people, their down-to-earthness does connect them to those that politicians leave behind. Vic feels the same kinship with Oz that he did with Rex. Now, when Link asks why Sophia is leaving this life behind, she replies with, Because I can. Sophia is, again, just wanting to have autonomy. She is tired of being trapped in this life and pulled back and forth between who she's controlling and who she's being controlled by. Sophia has yet to have control of her own life. Now, here, I feel like the way Oz is looking at Bella's nameplate, a Penguin for Mayor campaign is coming soon. This would have a lot of comic backing with Penguin being a mayor of Gotham City during the Forever Evil arc in Batman Adventures as well as in the graphic novel Batman Earth 1. We've also seen it several times in other media, both in the 1966 Batman show as well as in Batman Returns. The glory that I yearn to recapture is the glory of Gotham! and as well as in the Fox show, Gotham. Here Oz says, It's the same old war. Which is similar to what Sophia said of the gang war in the previous episode. Same winners, same losers. No matter who is at play in Gotham, it's the same fallout and devastation as always. Now here we hear Oz call Councilman Haiti pal, calling back to what he wrote in his first letter to him in episode one. Now here we can see that Bella has an arm sling, still healing from the assassination attempt on her during the Batman. And here we can see the water line and dirt from where the water came up during the flooding on the columns. Goodwin International Airport is also from the comics, named after comic writer Archie Goodwin. Now, the airport first appeared way back in Batman 34 and actually went unnamed in the comics until it was named after the author on the map of Gotham for the No Man's Land run. So the song playing here is a cover of the traditional American folk song, Where Did You Sleep Last Night, popularized by Lead Belly and Nirvana. This song reflects on themes of betrayal and abandonment seeking truth in a relationship. Sophia burning her father's items to this song is an emotional catharsis. She is purging years of trauma suffered at the hands of her father in the very room that started it all. Now, here we can see the same watch that she gifted him the night that he shipped her off to Arkham. Sophia is trying in a last attempt to rid herself of the Falcons like Oz did the Moronis. Another example of how they are a mirror. The framing is even the same. And this once again plays into the whole theme of a bad baptism by fire kind of thing that we are seeing in this series. So next we hear Zhao say, Will you uh, end things here or drop them over the Atlantic? See if the penguin can fly. Penguins are famously, of course, flightless birds, but this also plays into the theme of this series being about escaping the depths and making your way to the top. But like we mentioned earlier, Oz doesn't need to fly. He has found a loophole to the top, which requires him to dig down. Here, Victor holds Sophia at gunpoint, another example of just how further into the criminal life he has fallen. The last time he and Sophia were this close, Victor couldn't even light a match, but now he's threatening her with a gun. So Sophia just wants out of this life, and Oz asks if she was planning on leaving, to which she said, I was hoping to. It's just another example of how she's had to fight for her autonomy her entire life. Every time she was offered out, it was a means to get rid of her, either her father locking her away or Johnny sending her to Italy. Now, the one time that she chose to leave on her own accord, she's had that taken away from her as well. Yeah, well, you and the Dilo never would. A chance to be somebody. 
Oz is radicalizing the underdog mentality in favor of getting these people on his side, which only shows how much of a hypocrite he really is when he murders Victor later in the episode. He gives every underdog the go-ahead to off their boss, but he gets to flip the script and kill Vic. Oz is only ever able to see Sophia as an extension of her father, and therefore rich and privileged. He won't ever be able to comprehend her struggle internally. Now, Oz has only experienced struggle in his life because of his status and disability. He sees Sophia, who is able-bodied and wealthy, two things that he didn't have the privilege of being born into. However, Sophia has never had to care about money, so Oz is right in some regard about her privilege. But we have to keep in mind that Sophia has experienced the struggle of being a woman in a man's world. Next, we hear Oz call himself a man of the people, a tactic used by many, even here in our real world as of late, to garner a following. They don't actually care about any of the people. He only cares about his own public perception. As Sophia said in episode 3, the people are desperate for something to hold onto, and Oz sees this and knows he can fill that vacuum as someone that people have a commonality with. He sees this weak spot and how being a man of the people will gain him favor. And I loved when Sophia said, You're going to hell. I'll save you a seat. As if Oz hasn't already been there and thriving, going back to how the depths of Gotham represent hell. The hell that Oz, the devil, descended into in order to ascend to the top. Now, Oz knows the last place Sophia wants to be is Arkham Asylum. He knows that Arkham changed literally everything about her and made her into who she is today. And now she has no one on her side and money to help her get out, except maybe a friend in Bloodhaven. Now, when Oz says, tell me you're proud of me, man, the writing in this show, it is just so fantastic. No matter how much you dislike Oz by the end of the series, I can't help but feel bad for him. Sophia asked earlier, Has she told you she loves you yet? And now she'll never be able to. Francis said that she didn't want to die in some home, but here she is stuck in her body for the rest of her life. And Oz is sobbing at her bedside. Come on, just once, just tell me you're proud of me. Tell me I did good. Yet he's just ruined the rest of his mom's life. And then he has the audacity to say, It's what you wanted, mom. He believes so much that everything he's done was for her, but in reality, he's just a selfish man. Now, here we can see Vic and Penguin sitting on these blocks, and that mirrors the ending of the first episode of the show. Vic says, You're, fa you're fa family to me. But Oz can't have that. Anytime he's had family outside of his mother, they have disappeared. Oz sees family as a weakness and something his enemies can use against him. And as much as he wants to be the guy that's there for everyone and a man of the people, Oz can't have Victor that close to him. The first murder that Oz committed in his family was hands off. He didn't touch either of his brothers. He locked them in the depths of Gotham. But in the last murder of a member of his family, he is choking them. It's personal. The way he kills him is so intimate and he even morphs his hug into this chokehold. Also here, when we hear Vic pleading for his life, Please. Oz. These are the exact same first words that he said to Oz in episode one after being caught trying to steal the rims on his car. Please, please, please. Both his first and last words in this story were begging Oz to please see him as valuable, to see him as more than another kid from the east side, something that fell on deaf ears both times. This was the moment when it became clear that Oz really is f***ing evil full stop, once again reminding us that this was the origin story for a truly formidable and classic Batman villain. This show brilliantly made us like the Penguin for the duration of the show, but it ended with him being right here where we needed him to be in order to serve the grander story, of course, of the Batman. The best part of the Reeves' first villains is how humanly evil they are. Riddler was a radical terrorist, something that's not supernatural or out of this world. And Penguin, he's a narcissistic egomaniac who kills anyone who gets in his way. Yet again, another true-to-this-world villain. Showing the realistic evils of these villains makes us understand why Batman does what he does every night. The Penguin is a completely deplorable person. Oz tells Vic, You're a man. That's all that's left. 
which didn't even last more than a minute. Oz truly doesn't mean anything he says to anyone. He cares absolutely about no one in this world as much as he thinks he does or as much as he cares about himself. He literally throws away Victor's ID just like he threw Victor away, letting him fade away into the Gotham River for no one to ever find. And Oz throwing Vic's ID into the water closes his story in the same way that it started. He won't be ID'd and he will die as a nobody, just as he came into the story. And it also calls back to the themes of drowning. We had the Riddler's flood, the drowning of Oz's brothers, and now this. So we now see that Rush is back working at Gotham. Now, either he lied and never actually quit, or he has now rejoined the staff because Sophia is there. You quit. You abandoned me. I left because I had to. Because I could. So Sophia is being sent marriage proposals in her mail, something that a lot of serial killers like Richard Ramirez and Ted Bundy received. She has become an icon and garners a bit of a fan base and crazed lovers as the hangman, which is something that she never wanted. Sophia is so turned out to Rush that we can't fully hear him. He's muffled up until he says, She says she's your half sister. So Selena Kyle, AKA Catwoman, has reached out to her half sister. Remember they share a father in Carmine Falcone. I wanna know why a guy like Falcone I owe you anything. Because he's my father! Now, Maria Kyle, Selena's mom, was one of the workers at the 44 Below Club where she was murdered by Carmine. Selena tried to kill Carmine in The Batman, something that Sophia is of course grateful for. They have a camaraderie not only based on being half-siblings, but their shared hatred for their corrupt father and all of the corrupt men in Gotham. So when Sophia starts to read the letter, the Catwoman theme begins to play. <laughs> Here we see that Oz has a new car, but it's just as purple as the last one. Well, technically it's plum. Oz is wearing exactly what the Penguin wore in his first appearance in Detective Comics number 58, a bow tie, a top hat, and a yellow vest. And now all we need is that monocle. So Oz is going up to the La Corona apartments. The only time we've seen the building has been from the outside, looking up from the poor neighborhoods. Now Oz is at the top. He's the king of Gotham, and now he's living in the castle. La Corona even means the crown in French, as we've mentioned in previous breakdowns, and Oz is now officially the king of the city. And this means that Oz has got his mom a penthouse just like he promised her at the beginning of the episode. On the top floor, in a penthouse like you want, with a view of the whole friggin' city. Except it's exactly what Francis begged him not to do in episode six. She asked him to never allow her to get to this point, and now he's acting as if it's a joy for her. Now, this is also similar to his relationship with her in Penguin Pain and Prejudice. In that comic, Penguin's mom is also in a vegetative state, and Oz gives her gifts upon gifts until she dies. He makes his own narrative for their relationship, just as he is doing here. And Oz mistakes her tear of despair for one of happiness, and that is just the perfect presentation of Oz's effect on people. Sophia said earlier that Oz feels nothing, and that is so true. Oz doesn't know true emotion. His mother is trapped against her will because of him for the rest of her life, and he still sees it as a gift to her. And we have to emphasize that Oz keeping his mom alive in this catatonic state shows us just how selfish Oz is as a human being. So here we see Eve dressed up as Oz's mom, the way she was dressed that night that they went to Monroe's. And for Christ's sake, this is just really f***ing creepy. Serious Homelander vibes going on right here. Tell me you love me. Here we are seeing Oz again brush over everything that just happened with dancing. He told Sophia, It's a hell of a lot more fun to dance. And he's practicing that same mentality right now, doing exactly what he and his mom did all those years back. When Sophia confronted Eve, she asked if Oz had ever seen the real Eve, essentially asking if Eve's dressed differently for different men. Here, she is dressing up as Frances as what Oz most needs right now. And this shows us that she is really leaving up to her Eve Carlo surname. In the comics, Basil Carlo is Clayface, a former actor turned serial killer and mud monster. While Eve isn't an actor, she does act for her clients and she morphs into what they need in each moment, exactly how Clayface can morph into what role he needs to fit. We hear Eve whisper sweet nothings to him, again calling back to Sophia's mimicking of her in episode 5. He's the best you've ever had. Eve says, Gotham's your sweetheart. And this is exactly what Francis said to Oz in episode 1. This city is meant to be your sweetheart. 
Now, we started this series in the depths of Gotham, and now we have risen to the top along with Oz. And the episode ends on the best note with the bat signal up in the sky. Now, however, Oz is on the same level as the light. When we saw the bat signal in the Batman, it was always from the gaze of the criminals looking up into the sky in fear. But now, however, we are on the same playing field. Oz is now a fully worthy foe of the bat. Oz did ask Bruce when he first met him. You know my reputation. Bruce replied, I do. Do you? And at the time, he was just a small Falcone underling, and now he's fully the Penguin and on his way to being an all-time Gotham rogue. And that was our complete breakdown of the Penguin. Thank you so much for watching, and let us know other series you would like to see a complete Easter egg breakdown of here on the channel. I want to give a special thanks to my good friend Lee Mazio for all of his help in writing these breakdowns. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Colton Ogburn.